2019 school committee meeting to order. I don't know, do we have any other boards that need to call to order? Okay, and is there any uh, public input for items not on the agenda? Okay, none being seen. Um, tonight, I'll just go through. We, we will have the consent agenda, our reports. Uh, we have the FY 2020 presentation on the budget uh, for regular day and special education cost centers. We have one item of new business uh, related to school committee vacancy. And that's it for this evening. Um, so why don't we go ahead with the consent agenda. Move to approve the consent agenda. Any second? Second. Any no discussion. Take a vote. All those in favor? And the motion carries 5-0. Excellent. And reports. Usually we start with our student. Um, I'm going to say Director of Student Services probably doesn't have a report today because we're doing the budget. Got a big report later. <laughs> big report <laughs> on the agenda. agenda. Um, Ditto. Uh, dinner. Ditto for Gail. Me yeah. as well. All no right. report. Dr. Doherty? Uh, two. Two things. Uh, first is uh, Monday, um, and we'll see what happens with the weather right now, <laughs> but on Monday we have the annual Martin Luther King celebration, um, which will begin with a breakfast at 9.30 in Main Street of the performing, in front of the Performing Arts Center, um, and then the main program will begin at 10 o'clock. Um, it's being sponsored by the Human Relations Advisory Committee and the Clergy Association, and Reading Embraces Diversity, I believe. Yeah. yeah. So those three um, organizations. I, I will say that we are making a lot of decisions tomorrow uh, on events this weekend uh, concerning the weather. So um, we, we know we've already shifted one event, which is the Coolidge Show. The Coolidge Show will be happening. Um, there'll be two shows on Saturday. So there'll be a matinee at 2 o'clock, and then uh, the regular evening show, which I believe is at 7.30, Sarah? 7.30. Am I looking? Okay, 7.30. Friday night. Yeah, um, there will not be a Sunday show because of, mm -hmm. um, because of the, the storm that looks like is coming. So tomorrow we'll be working very closely with the facilities department and DPW uh, to make some, most likely some additional cancellations or shifts in programs. And the Martin Luther King celebration may be one of those things that changes. Mm -hmm. So that was one report. Okay. The second report is, um, as we talked about at the December 20th meeting, when Late Start was being discussed, we were uh, also looking at a change in the Rise Preschool start time for next year. And so uh, Kelly Boswick has been working with teachers and also consulted with the Rise PTN. And last night um, at her uh, open house for new parents um, announced, and then we did send out uh, information after that, that uh, Rise Preschool, both at Wood End and at the high school, will begin at 8 o'clock next year. Mm -hmm. um, so if it's a full day program, it will go from 8 o'clock to 2 um, p.m. And then the half day programs will obviously be shorter. But all the Rise Preschool classes will begin at 8 o'clock next year. The rationale behind that, it will allow parents to be able to drop off their uh, young, youngest school age children uh, first. And then if they have elementary age students, um, then they'll be able to get to the elementary school by the start time for elementary school, which will be 825. Great. So those are my two reports. Okay, and committee members? Mr. Rasmussen, Mr. Robinson. So just briefly, uh, last Tuesday night, the recreation committee met we spent a lot of time discussing the uh, Birch Meadow project. Uh, there's still a lot of work going on with that, so not not really anything to report. Just that's what we that was that was the <coughs> substance of the meeting. And Dr. Doxer, yep. I just have a quick. Um, just in addition to Dr. Doherty's. Um, report on the Martin Luther King. I just wanted to say a huge thank you. There are so many people that make that possible, but it's going on the fourth year that Honeydew Donuts is um, providing the donuts and Reading Cooperative Bank is providing the waters 
and Anthony's Pizza is um, providing pizza for the rehearsal tomorrow of the Metco, Friends of Metco Chorus, which now has 30 kids yeah. from Reading and Boston singing together. So it's amazing. So thank you to the people that are making this and the companies that are making this possible. And please, I'd love to see you there. Mr. Bobbin. Okay, I just have one um, quick report. I would just like to congratulate Dr. Darty. He ran the Goofy at Disney. No, dopey. So dopey. 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 Oh my gosh, I did it wrong. The goofy dopey. too. Which yeah, I guess, is, guess Goofy and Dopey. Yeah. Which means that in the course of four days, he ran a 5K, a 10K, a half marathon, a full marathon, did personal records, personal bests on both the half marathon and the full marathon, did the marathon in 509. And for that, you get to be, you get the dopey, dopey. award. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I just wanted to congratulate him. And, um, Thank you. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. So all right, I think that's all of our reports. So <coughs> we'll go right into the FY20 budget presentation. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I want to thank, again, all of our administrators, team chairs, principals, assistant principals, directors for being here this evening. Um, already have had a, a very event-filled day, I'm sure. Um, we, appreciate, we appreciate you being here. We are also going to hear from a couple of our principals this evening when we uh, discuss the special, special education cost center, cost center budget. So what we're going to focus on tonight are your two largest cost centers, the regular day and the special education cost center. Um, so the regular day cost center is the largest of the five cost centers. It is 58.1% of our budget. Uh, the increase for this year is a 1.4% increase and in some of the major changes in this budget um, are, include the following. One is uh, we do have some enrollment shifts in kindergarten and first grade. We had a couple of years where, uh, and it's our current grade one and grade two, where we had uh, lower enrollment. Um, so we were below what, normally we have around 300 students in a grade. And so we were, we were less than that in our current grade one and in grade two. Um, what we have seen both this year and what we will see next year is that we're back up to well over 300. We're at 310, 320 range. Uh, what that means is, is that our grade one classes are going to go up next year uh, and our kindergarten classes will, will be up next year. So there is a net addition of 1.2 FTE elementary teachers to address those uh, changes in classes. Uh, we will see three first grades at Wood End. Currently there are two. And we will see four first grades at Killam and four kindergartens at Killam. So that's why you see the 1.2 FTE uh, increase. In addition, in this cost center, you're going to see also um, all of the contractual step column and COLA increases per the collective bargaining agreement for represented uh, staff. There's also a placeholder allocated for salary market adjustments and for cost of living adjustments for non-represented staff to retain and attract staff. So the, the non-represented staff in this cost center would include your principals, assistant principals, uh, curriculum <coughs> coordinators. Um, those, those positions are non-represented. We also have funding in this cost center uh, for any curriculum updates aligned with the Massachusetts curriculum frameworks. Uh, recently there's been some uh, approval of the, the social studies curriculum framework, so you will see in your budget <coughs> that there is an increase in the middle school curriculum line item. Uh, primarily because we will be adding civics in grade eight next year, um, which I know we're all very excited. There will also be shifts in some other grades to accommodate the changes that will be made in grade eight um, in social studies. We're also looking at some of the other curriculum areas. Uh, Chris and her team are doing a fantastic job working with teachers in, in looking at what other changes we potentially could be making next year. And she'll be doing a presentation in February on the whole curriculum renewal piece that, that we're moving forward. We're also seeing some increases in our regular day uh, transportation. That's a contractual increase. 
Uh, we also are seeing an increase in the number of homeless students that are requiring transportation. Um, so that, that's also reflected in the, the bus transportation line item. Uh, as we mentioned last time, uh, last meeting, there is an increase in the full day kindergarten tuition offset of 151000 And that's because we now have, as I mentioned earlier, we are seeing a, an increase in tuition paying full day kindergarten students. Uh, next year, we right now are at 90% uh, of students that are in full day kindergarten tuition paying students. Um, and we also are seeing an increase in staffing to go along with that, so that's why the offset is increasing to reflect that. Uh, we are also seeing an increase in the revolving account offset from the Coolidge and Parker extracurricular revolving accounts, and that's to fund the stipends. Our students at the middle school do pay a user fee to participate in the shows. One is this weekend uh, at Coolidge, and then we have one in March at Parker. Um, and so this is something that we're going to monitor annually, um, uh, and we will see how, how this plays out. And then we, you're also going to see um, decreases in the district-wide technology curriculum and professional development line items. Remember that in the override, we did have additional funding um, added to the balance to the, the base budget um, that we proposed prior to the override. So we are going back to similar levels of, uh, for that. We still have the professional development, the curriculum and technology we feel necessary to move forward with that. One of the things that is different, and, and that's thanks to the override, is that we have a lot more in-house capacity to provide PD. So a lot of our professional development now is being provided by curriculum coordinators. Um, Chris, is, Chris is providing some of that. Our building principals are part of that. And so what that allows us to do is to be able to have less funding allocated to have to have outside professional development. Um, so we are utilizing that um, on an ongoing basis. So by object, you could see uh, what I just mentioned as the major changes is reflected here. Uh, your professional salaries, your clerical salaries are, are reflected with the contractual increases. Uh, the professional salaries is also the 1.2 FTE teachers that I mentioned. Um, the decrease uh, in the other salaries, really that's, a ref that's your regular education paraeducators. That uh, really is a result of uh, we, we budgeted more than we actually uh, spent. Also, most likely hiring people that came in at lower rates from the previous year. Um, your contractual services, your supplies and materials, and other expenses, those are going down because of the three areas that are being decreased, as mentioned earlier, in technology, professional development, and curriculum, for an overall increase of 1.4%. The staffing that you see here, the, 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 the big change, if, if you want to call it a big change, is the one2 uh, elementary teacher change um, in that line item. We did see one slight change with regular education paraeducator, paraprofessional, uh, point one. But um, overall, the staffing is consistent from, uh, uh, from this current year, I should say. And then if you look in the budget book, pages 25 to 27, it breaks down in detail uh, the, the areas that I just highlighted for you. And I know uh, Mr. Robinson in the past has talked about other expenses, and you can see the other expenses are broken down on page 27, the last section. And as I mentioned, professional development has decreased, um, technology decreased. I don't know if there were any questions regarding regular questions day. questions on regular day? Mr. Bobbing? Yeah, thank you. Uh, could we go back to the number slide with the dollars? Previous one? Yeah, thank you. So <clears throat> I was able, I followed the, the, um, the narrative you had, but I still had a couple questions that weren't answered. So you talked about the comparison between 
the adopted budget FY19 and the requested budget, but I wanted to go back a year and compare the requested budget in FY20 column to some numbers in the <laughs> actual expended in 2018. So that's my reference point, those two columns. I know it's kind of a far away from people sitting in the, behind the table here, but. Um, so for the non-salary components, I had some questions for three non-salary components, contract services, supplies and materials, and then other expenses. So for each of these, there's fairly substantial jumps compared to the actual expended in, in 2018. So I just want to run through those. For contract expenses, if I compare 142695 under requested budget, that's 20, roughly 20% more than the 120000 expended in FY18 for contract services, which is about a 24% increase over the year before that. So there's been a you 24% know, increase, then we had the override year with FY19, and now we're still ending up 20% higher than where we were before the override. So maybe just take that piece and kind of explain some of the drivers for contract services going up 20% compared to actual 18 two years ago. For contract services, that is 100% bus related. Bus related, okay. So if you're comparing 18 to yes. 20, you have two years worth of contractual increases in regular day transportation as well as a significant increase in the number of homeless students that we're transporting. So that's. Mm -hmm. 100% of what's driving that increase is you've got two years of contractual increases in the buses. And was the bus contract like renegotiated this year for next year? It, when it was renegotiated two years ago. It's a five year contract. So we're on the same contract as so the we, 19? Yes. Okay. So each year of the five years, the, the rate goes up on the bus contract. So that is purely, it, it's contractual increase in that. Also, it can fluctuate depending upon the number of paid riders on right. the paid route. So we have had a decrease in the number of paying students, which will drive this number up. And historically, so I would say if you look 17 and 18, we probably had two to three homeless students we are transporting. Now <coughs> we have over 10 this year. So it's a combination of yep. more demand and higher cost to meet that demand from the country. Okay. Um, same question for supplies and materials. We can see if I compare the 433,000 number under actual expended in FY18, it goes up 67% to 725,000. So what's driving that? Supplies and materials is also a little bit trickier because if you remember when we were doing the FY18 budget, we made, we made cuts in the per pupil mm -hmm. spending, which we added back in the FY19. We also cut technology, so in order to limit the number of staffing cuts, we made cuts that impacted these line items that were added back as part of the override budget and then carried forward into the current year. So help help me understand, so you're saying that's building the, what, what's the name for this? The building-based building budget. Building-based budget, so, building -based we, budget. so it's like, so, so it means we, we had cut 100. We cut about 100. 100,000 from that. So, and then we replenished it in 19, so I get, I get the 815,000. I'm, 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 I, I follow you. What, what I'm having a hard time with is understanding why the building-based budgets went up 67% from actual expended in 18 to two years later, right? So if, if we say the, there was a component of catch-up in the override where meaning like we, we had fallen behind supplies and so forth for the district, we replenished that, and now we're back at a steady state, and our steady state is two-thirds higher than it was before the override. Help me understand why that is. So so 100,000 of it would be the building base, which we replenished, and that is split across five elementary, two middle, and the high school. So that's, each one of them got their regular allocated amount. That is an item that we revisit each year, and if the way that this works is they are responsible, we, had, we have the slides from last year that we could add back for in another presentation where if you look at the science where we rolled out science that was funded at the district level, now when they're replenishing all of the various books and materials, that comes out of their building-based budgets. So for us to cut the building-based budgets is not a sustainable model. The other piece too that is within the supplies and materials line are the curriculum. Yeah, so we had added curriculum money within the override while we have cut that, it is still at a higher level than it had been previously because we had cut curriculum in prior years to balance the budget. So now we're getting more to a steady state number. So to, from 18 to 20 is a little bit 
skewed because we had to make cuts in 18 in order to balance uh, the budget. Okay, so there so were cuts. 18 is not a, a level is service. Not a level no. service budget. Right. 19 got us to level service plus. Okay, in so 20, we're, t we're able to readjust some of the override funding and mm -hmm. shift some of that. But 18 to 20, you have a, a non level service budget to a level service budget. So it's a little bit harder to compare and contrast a year we made cuts. So, so would, it, would it be fair to say if I, if I back to 17 even, where we're 543, well, 16 is 577, but somewhere in the 500s, right? We so didn't do a level, we haven't done a level 16 service. 16 and 17 you were cutting. So we've been shorting <laughs> yes. building-based budgets for a while. So we yes. take, we go back to level service of what they, we feel the schools have asked for and needed for, con plus consumables for the new curriculum. And that, that's, that's what's you driving that increase. 20? Yeah, so I could could I understand that that jump to 725? If we say that's the new, we'll call it steady state. That's where we quote unquote should be. If that's what you're proposing, yes. if that's the view. So if we view that, if the if the notion is okay, this is where we should have been at this point, then we can understand that as a combination of we'll call it fully funding the needs of the schools for consumables, for the curriculum they used to have, plus the new curriculum, which adds a little bit more consumables to what they had before. That's where we're getting this big right. jump. Okay, that's helpful. Last last question on this, the other expenses, right? We've, so fairly fairly big number, and, and I know there's a lot of detail in the budget book that's not in the slide, and that's okay. It's about a 33% jump, and this one bumps all over the place, right? If you look at FY16 for others. Page you on, Nick, sorry. Oh, I'm on, just, I'm oh, just on the slide, slide okay. that we're all looking it's on at. Page yeah. 27. So page 27 gives you the detail. Where it says other expenses. Yeah. So, but to help us maybe understand at a high level the, the drivers, the, so you know, went from 414K to 341 to 437. Now we're up at so 583, so it's a 33% jump. So help us understand that. One if we're looking at 16, 17, 18, this is another area where we made cuts. We significantly decreased professional development. We decreased technology right. in order to fund the budget. So again, it was not a level service budget when we did that. So if we looked at 19 and 2019, we added the override funding for right. technology and professional development. The other item that is going through this is our, in software licensing and support, our Office 365 renewals, which have gone, those increase each year, so we've seen steady increases in that, but the biggest change has been within professional development and our replenishment of technology mm -hmm. that we had cut those items historically. Okay, that's helpful, thanks. Mr. Robinson. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, just a, well, one, observation request and then some questions on figure uh, page 27 figure 15 so in the past we and we've had a column on there that shows the FTEs associated with each salary <coughs> I know we have a separate chart for that but I I think it, I'd like to see the so if you look at uh, just use as an example, uh, uh, assistant principal. You know, just put a, a column there that shows how many it's FTEs are associated with it. You know what I'm referring to? So you're talking about that is on a separate graph a separate somewhere. Chart. But yeah. I think I was kind of flipping back and forth. It's kind. Of, I think it's good to have right there. That's just my. Probably we don't agree, but what, which which is the other chart where the FTEs it is are later in the. The staffing chart's on page 28. The regular day staffing chart. Oh, on the other page. So move yeah. that column next to the, to the dollars. So you're talking about the budgeted FY20 FTE? Budgeted FY20. Correct. Yeah. Just not a big deal. Just, uh, my questions are, uh, if you can go back to the slide before this. The, on bullet number four on the, uh, so how many shows is that? Is that, I know there's one at each school. It's but one at each school, so what this is is next year we are looking to do, this is more of a one-time offset next year to fund basically 100% of the stipends. So it's one at the middle school, one, one at each middle school. 
going forward, we don't anticipate taking this large of an offset, but as we've looked at the balances in those revolving accounts, they've grown to a point that we need to start to look at ways to take them down. So this is an adjustment for next year, and then going forward, I would anticipate that number to be significantly lower. So, so, go ahead. so I can't remember, what is the actual stipend uh, the stipends are several stipends for the producer. No, I know what the they are, but how? What's the dollar? It's approximately twelve thousand per middle school. For, for oh, one. It's twenty-four thousand. Twenty-four thousand is. So it is that. That's yeah. what yeah. I thought. Yeah. Okay, that's, and that's just for one person or multiple. No, it's multiple people. For it's probably four, four or five. Yeah. People. Multiple people, but for one show one at show each middle school. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I know we're, we said we're doing a deep dive on this at the high school. So but, we're um, looking at it at all of them. Historically, we have not taken offsets from the middle school, but we have seen increased user participation as well as increased revenues from the show. So we're now looking at it to say it should be able to support some of the stipends that are going towards the production. And, Is that and, the, sorry, and the middle school, uh, the, the, the fee that those students pay, is that it's less than the with the with the user fee at the high school or it's less. less. It's less. I think it's, I can't remember, I don't want to say what it is. It's less than the high school, I know that. Uh, there's a tech fee if you're just in the tech and then there's a the cast. So we actually are going to sit down after this year's production and look at all of the numbers, look at all of the costs and all of everything that goes into it to look to see if we need to think about adjusting the fees in future years or what else can we do for the shows. So Sarah, Ricky, and I will be sitting down later in the spring to take a deep dive into the middle school program. Okay, the, I just have one yeah. other question. My other question was on the, uh, the next bullet down on the uh, specifically with the professional development uh, and Dr. Doherty just mentioned that uh, we're going to bring some of that that training in house. Mm -hmm. I guess I just want a confirmation that we're not losing anything that that we would norm just as a way to cut the budget. We're not taking away something. We're just we're supplementing in in house people to do what we would normally pay for outside. Or the the needs are always going to change based on the areas that we're working on. So, for example, and you know, Chris can certainly add to this. You know, we're doing a lot more of our literacy and math training with our curriculum coordinators this year, rather than going outside and bringing someone outside in. Okay. So that's a decrease in you know funding that we need. Okay. We'll still bring outside consultants when we feel we need to, but we're trying to build our own infrastructure to use our own talent here first, but we're absolutely not planning on cutting professional learning. There's going to be a lot of learning <laughs> moving and, forward. <laughs> and, and with the uh, collective bargaining, we went down to the, we've reduced the number of days. That has nothing to do with, with this, correct? No, we did not did reduce not. the number of days. Meetings. 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 We yeah. went from three yeah. to two. Three but, to two. But the, the one that was reduced was under teacher control, not so we're, that has nothing to do Correct. With. We still have lots of professional learning yeah. built into our calendars. Thank you. I just, thank you. Uh, I just wanted on the um, revolving account. So I'm just looking, if we go sort of the back of the book there, it gives you the balances of those. It shows the works, where we are in the balance on the 18. I, I'm just sort of looking at it saying so, those accounts are still going to have a decent amount, some a, a appropriate amount of funds in them. Yes, and what's difficult with the extracurricular is the expenses typically happen before the revenue comes yeah, in, so yes. that's why you right. can never bring keep them to zero, mm -hmm. but they are, we have seen them increase, so we want to make sure we're doing the right things with the funds that we have. Okay. Dr. Boxer? Question. Mm -hmm. um, I was actually um, happy to see that um, the substitute lines, it sounds, it looks like we put substitutes back. Um, She's on page 26. I'm on, yes, thank you. <laughs> um, so it looks, um, even from the override here, 
we went from 103,000 to 105,000 for the subs. So and that we did than increase than it slightly. That line is for long-term substitutes. So again, that is a difficult one based upon however many people are going out. We have a lot of teachers out this year. So we it is one that we continue to monitor. Okay. The other substitute line item you may be referring it's to is the daily. one under other salaries. Yeah. yeah. That that remained flat. Yeah, so it was like a two thousand dollar increase. Yeah, is that the short term sort of the less short expected? Term subs within the other salaries is the daily subs. The one up in professional salaries is long term substitute. So if somebody's out on say a maternity leave where they're out for three months, that would be a long term substitute. And my, my concern was, like you're saying, is on the temporary subs that come in for a day so that we don't have our parers or our tutors. We will still seven. have that. That is, we do build some of that into the paraprofessional line, but it's a combination of both because even though we may increase that particular line, it may end up being paraprofessionals depending whether or not we have the fill rates for the substitutes. So. Yeah. So Funding it on the budget is different than necessarily having the people in the classroom. It's a combination of u utilizing the paras as well as daily substitutes. What and we are finding is it's really the, the pool just isn't out there. <laughs> the economy is in a good place, and usually when the economy is in a good place, you tend to see it in areas like less substitutes available. Yeah, I guess my concern is just that we try hard to make sure that there are people other than the paras who have a job already. Yeah. We utilize a system where we basically put the positions out there and we have people calling. We're constantly hiring new substitutes. Yeah. The issue is it does not mean they're going to take the call when it comes in. So there, there are a lot of factors that play into that. We have, mm -hmm. I, I hear them calling subs to All come in for interviews mm -hmm. every day. We have people coming yeah. in. It's just a matter of they may not they may accept it and decline the next day. So unfortunately, it's not 100% in our control to actually have them take the position. I was glad, though, that there is yeah. funding. We're, we're yeah. trying to fund it. We just, but it, it, we, I, I will say it will be a combination of the paras as well as the substitutes. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> is it on the same subject? Let's just, different subject, same no, subject. Okay, <coughs> Mr. Bobby. Yeah, so <clears throat> I wanted to go back to the supplies and materials line item that we talked about. And I just want to understand something a little more detailed, but to, to answer my question, we'll need to look on pages 26 and 27 mm -hmm. of the budget book, mm -hmm. master spreadsheet. So <clears throat> in, the, in, the in the requested budget, which on the slide we had up earlier, uh, we have that $725,726 number for supplies and materials. That's broken down in detail on pages 26 and 27. So there's one number that really got my attention on page 27 here, which is science. So we see science go from, you know, in year 16, 17, 18, from 27,000, 33,000, 11,000 with cuts, um, 99,000, 100,000, right? That got my attention. And then I went to page 26, and I said, well, has that happened before? And the answer is yes. We have seen similar increases. Where? In elementary school curriculum. So if we go back to 17 to 18, you see a jump from 65,000 to 143,000. It, then it stays at about 100,000 the following year. But then this year, it comes back down to earth at 42,000. Mm -hmm. So two years up, so it's like yep. low. Well, I don't want to say, but I don't want to have value judgment. It's just... You have a number, you have a number, you have a super high number, a super high number, and now you're back down to a number that looks more like the number three years ago, right? So, so my question is, is science going to do that after the 19 and 18 and 19, or 19 and 20, excuse me. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're going high, high on science, mm -hmm. 19, 20. Are we going to see it come back down, or is it going to stay up at 100,000? So what I'll start with. So typically what, and I'm sure half the principals would stand up and correct me if I say this wrong as well. So what happens is in the first year of implementing a new curriculum, it is done out of the district level. So when you look at the curriculum num numbers, I'll use no Adam as an example because that was the science that we were implementing. So that is funded during the initial 
phases at the district level. Once it is rolled out, it becomes part of the building-based budget. So while we don't adjust the building-based budgets necessarily each year, the principals are responsible for purchasing the ongoing materials associated with that curriculum. So when you're looking at the science, that is for them to continue to purchase the material for the no atom curriculum within each building. So I do not anticipate that number at the building base level will decrease in future years. How did it de so the curriculum number that you see under elementary and high school, high school does the same thing by the way, it goes from 17,000 to 107,000 back down to 57,000 year to year to year, right? Yep. So why did, so are you saying those numbers came back down because once the curriculum was implemented, any it ongoing should. costs of maintaining right. that or administering the curriculum the goes somewhere else. The consumables at that point, they not move, the durables. Mo moves into a different right. category, right? Right. So <coughs> this curriculum, the science, are we seeing the accumulation of these implementations of elementary, high, and middle? We're seeing the consumables go up because each of those curriculums brings a consumables burden, if you would, that we maintain. So you implement in three grades, you have consumables for three grades now. You go to six grades, you have six grades. You go to 12 grades, you have 12 grades, right? So your consumables are going up as the curriculums are implemented. Am I getting that right? Okay, so we expect to stay up around closer to 100, not coming back down. If I could just give you one Please. slight adjustment to that. I think you, you have more consumables at the elementary level in science. You do have mid middle and high, but I think you have a lot more at elementary. So to, just to, oops, just can I follow that point? So to Mr. Bobbin's point, if you look at the um, elementary curriculum number, right, at, at 42, are we expecting that, how, how is that going to then trend going forward given what we know right now about elementary curriculum? Do we expect that to stay in that range or is it gonna, it'll jump up again? So some of this I will be addressing when I do my curriculum presentation okay. about a renewal cycle. So if you think of a clock, yep. if your curriculum renewal is at noon, then we may have to invest a lot of time, energy, and resources in either a full or partial implementation, or sometimes we have to do an addition change, like with the Fountas and Pinal. That would be at noon, right? Mm -hmm. Then at 3 o'clock, we would, we would say, okay, how is this working? Are there additional materials, resources, time, money, resources, personnel that we have to allocate to that? 6 o'clock, the same thing. At 9, we start looking at, is this something we want to continue? So all of those curriculum um, headings, if you went, content areas, are on a renewal cycle, and that's sort of what we're building this year, is where are you on that cycle? Mm -hmm. Because obviously our dollars only go so far. So for the few years that you mentioned, there was a major curriculum renewal in science. It had been many years since they had really purchased a lot of science materials kind of district-wide. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of STEM scopes. We, we, we purchased lots of things. We're still in that cycle of, okay, what do we need for science? How do we get all our science labs up to where we need them? Um, we didn't have a lot of hands-on materials in K-2. to We pulled out the no atom stuff. And so now that once we get past that sort of noon schedule, which was sort of, that's not always a one-year schedule, then we, that money, the replacement, a lot of the replacement, especially in the younger grades, goes into the building-based budgets. Um, and then the district doesn't own those pieces to it. We will then take a look at it at some point and say, well, gee, we didn't order all the materials. We only ordered X, but we really needed Y. Um, so that's, science is a good example of that. Um, so that's kind of where we are next year. We're earmarking a ton of money for middle school history and the social studies. They are going to get a ton of curriculum, time, money, resources, attention. <clears throat> they will be at noon. The following year we're going to look at social studies across the district because we have two years to implement the new social studies curriculum. So that's where we are as far as that. And the budget kind of reflects those pieces. Um, I think historically it hasn't always been done systemically or systematically. We're moving towards that. There's always wild cards because, for instance, we weren't sure that the state was going to redo the entire social studies curriculum. So sometimes we might say, all right, 2022 is your year at noon, right? 
but it may be now actually 2020 is your year because they changed things. Or we take a look at our own data and say, you know what, looking at MCAS, looking at Fountas and Pinal benchmarking and really talking to staff, this isn't really meeting our needs. And then we would up that schedule. But that's part of what our team is building, working with principals and really coming up with more of a three to five year plan of where are we in that. So the money really reflects that. Um, but it, in answer to your question, Elaine, is that sort of like boilerplate, like that kind of money? I think we're, we're starting to phase out of that. The high school numbers are still a little high um, for next year in science, but that's still building on those lab things that may have not been purchased in cycle one or two. Mm -hmm. I think the other part that can get a little bit tricky with this is similar to if you look at how the technology cycle works too. Yeah. It also depends mm -hmm. how we are purchasing the curriculum. So science may be very heavy purchasing items like this that you have to buy every year. Others might be licenses where we buy a three, five, six year mm -hmm. license. So you may have it, nothing, nothing, have it, nothing, mm -hmm. nothing. So it really depends on yeah, those cycles. exactly what yeah. curriculum and, and what it is we're getting. So you may see until we get into a cycle that there may be ebbs and flows of it depending what exactly is associated with it. Um, Ms. Sprowski, then Ms. Robinson. So um, this is actually to Mr. Wavin's point about that line, I'm continuing on with supplies and materials. So I think the point about why 2018 was so depressed has been covered, right? Like that's not a good baseline right. year, and I have nightmares about that budget mm -hmm. session and the principal saying this is, we will run out of paper and pencils. Like this is not a number that should ever be used. But something I did, because you bring up a really good point. If you look at the number from FY16, it was 5577 just over um, half a million dollars. If you figure two and a half percent increase over four years, it's like in the neighborhood of 10%, right? That brings you to 635. So you're within $100,000 that I don't think that even includes compounding. That's a really quick mm -hmm. little calculation. So you're actually within $100,000. So thinking about it that way makes that number a little bit more palatable to me. Something to like in terms of process to think about. Um, and the only other thing I wanted to say was to Ms. Kelly's point about curriculum renewal. Um, I don't think that's something we have historically had budget for. That's correct. Um, so, yeah. you know, in the other point, and you, I'm repeating a little bit of what you said, but so much of this is driven by the state level. Uh -huh. The state says we're going to do all new science curriculum and we're going to test your kids on it and we're going to publish those results. <laughs> you don't have a choice. Right. That isn't something the district decides to do. You have to do that. And we went to FinCom and asked for free cash to cover the curriculum right. renewal. So I actually would like to see this number up a little bit because we simply have to plan on it. We have to know that these curriculum changes are coming down the pike. And when social studies is done, there'll be another thing. So if, if that helps at all, that's how I'm getting comfortable with the number. Thank you. Ms. So Robinson. Just to follow on, just to clarify, so the 206%, that's the civics? At the middle school? At yeah. The middle yes, school. that's correct. That's where it's okay. going. That's, your, that's primarily your social studies. And on page 27, I'm just kind of going on some of the line items here. What are teacher resources? Twenty-five percent. It's four thousand dollars. So it's eight hundred. It's eight hundred dollars. <laughs> yeah, I understand, but I'm just. I've never seen that line before. So that's all part. Yeah. And one of the things I think is a little bit, and we have we show this presentation every year. And if you go to page twenty-eight, a lot of what you see on twenty-six and twenty-seven is the building budget amounts. Yeah. So each year the building principal allocates to the line items based on the needs of the building for that year. So they get allocated an amount of funding, which you see on page 28. That is dispersed through a lot of the line items in supplies and materials and other expenses. So the um, so teacher resources, I mean, that could be it, it could, could be planning books, yeah. teacher yeah. planning books. It's what just never, been. I've never seen it in the, as a. As a uh, That's been there every year. Yeah. yeah, that it's line's that been actual there. Reach. Yeah. So just what we've also been trying to do each year, I've been yeah. working with each of the principals to go through and look at each of the accounts and make sure we're being consistent with where we're putting items, collapsing items right. where we can. So we've been sort of trying to hit some of the larger dollar items to say what is this exactly is there a better category we could put it in and for some of the small ones that have a 
couple of thousand. I probably just have not gotten to that minute level with them for where they're actually quoting things. But those typically tend to be, um, it, it, like I said, it could be planners that they're using in their classrooms. It could just be miscellaneous items that they're, that the, they're ordering. The other question I had on that page was the uh, instructional services. So the instructional on that's this the page. translation. That's the, that's the so translation that services. Is, <coughs> that is, we've historically budgeted translation only within special education. There is a component that also is related to regular education. This is not a new item this year. When we budgeted for it last year, we had put it in contract services. So if you look at page 26, mm -hmm. we actually had $25,000 in instructional services there, which is part for surveys and part of it, 15,000 of it was for translation. The proper place we should be putting that is within the other expenses. So we're moving the budget to be where it should be. The actual that's why it's this down. year will hit where it should. So that's in instances where we may have students that need venues, report cards, permission slips. Student handbooks. Student handbooks translated, translated. Mm -hmm. into another language. So that's overall down then because it is 25, yeah. so it then it's 10 and 78. Yeah, yeah, yeah but it wasn't instances. clear yeah. that it was down. Yeah. yeah, so it's a reclass to be where it should have okay. been. So that instructional services was surveys and translation. Yeah. yeah. And so we did cut 7,500 out of the translation looking at where we're seeing the actuals come in this year. Okay, thank you. I uh, want to take questions from the, oh, sorry, well, Mr. Bobbin first. We talked oh. about our money, I want to, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry, yes, thank you, yep. Go ahead, Mr. Bobbin. Thank you. Um, so I want to talk about our time. We talked about our money, let's talk about our time. Uh, elementary school teachers, the addition of a 1.2 FTE based on enrollment. Can you, can you, can, can you tell us, maybe you can't at this point, and if you can't, that's fine, I'll just put it in a written question, but if, if we didn't increase the number of, of FTE full-time equivalents for elementary school teachers in the budget for 20, would the class sizes at the two schools that are mentioned in the slide um, exceed the, the school committee guidance for class sizes? Yes. Yes. Okay. And do you know by how much? So it would end, uh, I don't know the exact number. Joanne, how many do you have in kindergarten right now? Well, I have 23 in the program, but we're not doing Okay, so that's 55. So we're going from two classes to three classes. Mm -hmm. So if we stayed at two classes, we would have 28 and 27. 27 is high. And 28 is the even first higher. Grade, that's <laughs> the first grade, for next the first year. grade, that's really high. <laughs> that's, a, that's very um, big. It, it, uh, at Killam, the same thing. You have a larger kindergarten going to first grade. You requires a fourth classroom. We also have a larger kindergarten coming in uh, next year, so that that's why you see the shift. And so, uh, I'm always thoughtful of adding FTE to our kind of our overall <coughs> size of our of our district because that if I could if I could just add one piece a couple of years ago when we had the lower Thank enrollment right. we actually decreased teachers but uh, amidst budget cuts right did we do that, uh, that was no not enrollment. necessarily it was it was just a, it was a shifting so yeah because we had 1942 in elementary and FY 17 and then we 1845 and FY 18 so we went from 103.6 to one we dropped about three FTE on that right um, so I, I just, as long as this is, is required to maintain reasonable class size, 27 does not sound reasonable to me. So yeah, uh, unfortunately, you're also going to see, the other determining factor is classroom space. Mm -hmm. right. So first grade next year, we are going to have a couple of classes in some buildings that are going to be over the 22 because we don't have the space to add the classroom. Class. Right. right. Okay, thanks. On the Any questions from... Folks who have joined us tonight. <coughs> Matt, we're going to go ahead into the special did education. Mark, did Mark, was, Mark was calling the called finance to committee order. to order. Oh, oh, order. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. He has a quorum. I'm busy like, wait, wait. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we are now going to move to special education. I think Sharon is, and Gail's going to start, and then Sharon's going to go from there. <laughs> 
to, as we started to talk about in December when we did the current year update as well as the budget overview and what we talked about during our first budget presentation that we have made certain decisions within the special education cost center to not fully fund the out of district transportation and tuition based upon a lot of unknowns currently within those numbers as we're going through them looking at various placements and, and different items. We did mention at that time that we are continuing to meet with members of the finance committee as well as the town manager to make sure we're keeping everybody apprised as we go through the process. One of the items as we're going through this is all of us, the schools and the town, we do constantly look at our accommodated costs. So as we're going through this, we're keeping in touch with Bob. And as we go through, we are having conversations to look at each item within accommodated costs to see if there is any other items that may free up as we go through this. There's a lot of other items within there, whether it's snow and ice, which I felt really good about until I saw today's point. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't see Elaine did not bring the shovel, so I think we're Oh, trouble. I was supposed to bring the shovels in. Um, snow and ice, energy, there's a lot of items within there that are constantly moving. And what we do want to remind people, those numbers were set as part of accommodated costs back in the September time frame. So we will be meeting throughout this process to look at that and we will keep the committee apprised if there's any shifts within any areas in accommodated costs that we will be looking at. We also have been very upfront with finance committee as well as the town manager to say that more than likely we will need to go back to either finance committee or town meeting probably in the November time frame once we truly know what our special ed out of district costs are. So we just wanted to mm -hmm. remind folks of that as we go through this presentation that there are numbers that are potentially going to change during the process. Thank you. Sarah? Okay. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, and that, that is the nature of special ed. Things change. It's, um, we capture numbers at a moment in time, but children's needs change um, in our regular ed program that require identification, as well as children who are in programs may require adjustments. Um, so in going through the presentation here, we have the largest part of student services is special education that we focus on. Um, make sure I can read this myself. Um, and the central office team is myself or whoever sits in this chair as the director. We have an assistant director in the district. We have administrative assistance support and we are the central office team. It's a pretty uh, lean team. And then we have our team chairperson roles and there are folks assigned to every school. Um, they work on an administrator contract um, and they do a lot of facilitating of the evaluation process for children as well as the program oversight in the building. So they are essential. They are, are all mission critical to the success of our students. And they're also monitoring the programs for children who attend schools outside of the Reading Public Schools. Um, we have a number of kids. I ran the numbers the other day on the 17th. Um, I'm sorry, the 16th. We had 756 students with what we call active IEPs. That means the children are engaged in special education programs both within and in our audit districts. We have 99 students whose IEPs are actively being reviewed. Those are what we call the next IEPs. So there have been team meetings held. People have looked at how the children have done since their last meeting. Uh, people meaning the educators and the parents and proposed a new set of educational program goals. So there are 99 of those that are out waiting for a response from parents. We have 55 students undergoing evaluation right now. And we're required by our regs at least once every three years to reevaluate students, see where their, their needs are, do they still qualify, are our services meeting their needs, do they need changes. So there are 55 of those happening right now. 
38 of those are what we call initials, meaning those are children in our regular education programs whose parents and or teachers or jointly together feel that, geez, there might be a disability impacting this child's rate of learning. Let's take a closer look. So those children may in fact end up with individual education programs or they may not. Um, so that's just a snapshot in time in terms of what's happening. Um, I can run this a month from now. Those numbers will be different. There'll be more kids with active um, IEPs. There'll be more children undergoing a VAL. When we ran some numbers at the very end of December, putting together the budget book, um, we've added four kids just in two weeks of school time. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it, it, does, it does change. Um, some of the key items in our special education cost center are, it's very staff heavy, staff driven, um, but I'm gonna talk about what some of our requirements are, the essential goals of, our, um, of what our staff work on every day and what are the factors that impact our expenses. So we have, um, the main mission is really supporting the needs. We, all of our children are expected to participate in the curriculum, to learn, to achieve at the same levels as their non-disabled peers. Um, to the best of their ability. So we have very high standards that we're working to support the children in learning. Um, a lot of our time goes also to collaboration. Um, we cannot work in special education without a real close partnership in gen with our general education educators and our families. Um, we have regulations we have to adhere to. Um, special education is the most highly regulated aspect of our educational mission both from the federal level and the state. So there's a few of the agencies that we report to. Uh, OSEP, I think, was out for a visit in September yep. um, from the federal side. So they, they make those periodic visiting tours, but they establish regulations that we have to adhere to. Um, Massachusetts is kind of uh, for, in the forefront of education, both for general and special education. We're leaders in the nation. Um, <laughs> and has been a leader in special education as well. We have some rules and regulations unique only to Massachusetts that we must adhere to, and we have to constantly keep up with those. Um, we have lots of legal decisions that occur through the whole uh, Bureau of Special Education process, through the court systems across the nation that then influence how our regulations are interpreted. Um, so those we have to keep up as well. Um, there are the mass departments. We have what's called tiered focused monitoring is coming up. It was previously referred to as a coordinated program review. Mm -hmm. oh. That is the federal government requires every state to monitor compliance with regulations at a minimum of once every three years, which is done through a real intensive deep dive once every six and then what's called a mid-cycle once every three years. They're changing the name of it. Um, to tiered focus monitoring, but Reading is, will have on-site visitation from the state next year in that process, and this year there's a lot of prep between now and uh, May 1st that has to go on. So those are some of the things that influence us. Um, as our teams work with the children, work with the families to figure out what to do best, they come up with what's called an IEP, which is your individual education program, that is a decision made at the team level. Um, it isn't something that you know John could take a look at or I could take a look at and say, you know what, I don't think that's a good idea. You're not gonna do that. We're not allowed to, we're prohibited by regulation in fact. Um, teams are mandated in Massachusetts to make the decisions in the best interest of the child that keeps them aligned and as close to the regular ed curriculum as possible. Um, and again, those can't be changed just because they might cost too much money. Um, it's irrespective of cost impact. And th those are some of the, just some of the highlights of the regulations that we have to pay attention to and be sure that we adhere to. Um, and again, in Massachusetts, our own legislature really demonstrates strong leadership across the nation in, in how we ought to interpret our regs and in supporting kids. One example is in Massachusetts, we are obligated to provide a special education program to what they're called eligible students. 
up until the point they either receive an MCAS endorsed diploma, that's one way they exit, or they turn 22. The rest of the country, it's 21. So in Massachusetts, we have a whole other year. We are obligated to educate children who need um, this service because they were not able to attain, because of their disability, a typical MCAS endorsed diploma. But we have one more year compared to other states. So that's just one example of how things are a little bit different here. Um, we also have the highest number of special education private schools um, in the nation. So we have a lot of um, intellectual, um, an intellectually driven economy here in Massachusetts where that is a lot of our products so a lot of our education, not only general and special education, is geared towards really facilitating that development in students. So it's a bit different here than other parts of the country. Um, we have in special education, we are required to identify the disability type that most fits what the issue is interfering with a child's ability to learn. They can in fact have more than one disability, but it's important to know that they, we have all kinds of children with learning needs and disabilities here in our schools, in our commonwealth, and in every classroom. We have to look at what's the impact of that disability. And it can be a mild, to a moderate, to a severe. Um, children can change across that spectrum throughout their educational career as well. That's why we have to be such a responsive system. We cannot afford to let a child spend a fourth grade year just saying, you know what, he'll catch up next year. He's only got one year in fourth grade, we have to make it count. Mm -hmm. So we have to be responsive and we have to take care of the student's needs. Um, we have a lot of programs here in Reading. I'm, I've really been quite impressed with every educator I've met and talked with um, and the parents' input and their perceptions and participation in the process is, is highly valued here in Reading. Um, they have really good ideas about what will help their children. So we have a, the right mix to get it right for the kids every year. We have a few of our principals, I think, are, are going to be happy to speak and provide a little more information about some of what do these kids look like in our schools? What do our programs look like? What do we have to do? So I'm going to defer the microphone for a few minutes to... Julia's first. I think Mrs. Hendricks to speak first. Thank you, Julia. Good evening. My name is Julia Hendricks. I'm the principal at Birch Meadows School. And I was asked to come and talk tonight about some of the special education programs that we have in our building. Um, Birch Meadows School houses some district-wide programs that are very specifically for children who have communication disorders that can be impacting them in terms of social interactions, learning, um, children who have developmental delays and children on the autism spectrum disorder. So children from all over the district come to our school for these programs. And then within the school, we have children who are in what we call one of these programs who are included in a general education classroom with supports for the entire school day. And we have children who are in substantially separate settings for the entire school day with some inclusion into general education. And then recently, in the past two years, we've had to create a whole new category of programming for children who don't really completely fit one model. So we've started creating a hybrids for specific children so that we are actually creating a program. We don't have another program in the district that really matches. We want these children to stay with us because we feel like having them educated in Reading with their neighbors, with their friends is the right place to be. So then we are creating what we call hybrid programs where we take elements from both programs and put them together. Um, so to give you an idea of how our programs have grown, seven, in 17-18 last year, in the substantially separate program, we had 11 and a half students because we had a hybrid. And in the inclusion program, we had 20 and a half. So we had a total of 32 children. This year, we have a total of 38 children in these programs. 
including hybrid children. And next year, with our numbers projected, we're going to have 42. So our program is growing. And we're actually really proud of that, because we feel like we're providing children, all children, with a really solid educational experience. But what happens when our programs grow, and also what happens as we flexibly respond to student need, is it puts different kind of stress on staffing. So for instance, children in the substantially separate program have completely individualized education programs. So a certain portion of their day has to be one-to-one -one instruction. We also have a situation where we have a child who's doing really wonderfully in the substantially separate program and we want that child in an inclusion classroom more, but that means we have to have a staff person who can go with that child to that classroom more. So that as we respond, we, our needs change. Um, all of these children, or most of them are getting speech and language services. So as our program grows, we have more need for speech and language pathologists in the building. They're getting occupational therapy services. They're getting physical therapy services. So you can imagine if you're going from 32 to 42 students in a two-year period, you also have all these related services that increase. What is um, wonderful about these programs is that they're here in Reading. These are Reading's children, and they're being educated in Reading. What's a challenge is that we have to flexibly respond to what children need. And this year, for instance, over the summer, we got four children in the inclusion program that we didn't even know were coming until the summer. So that we had to sit down and say, okay, these children are coming, what do they need? How do we assign staff? How do we meet their needs the best possible way that we can? It also creates a space situation. When you have, you think, oh, I have eight children in a classroom. That's not that many children, but if you have eight children with all the adults who work with them, you suddenly have a classroom that's very full and has to have six to eight individual working spaces so that children who are working on something individually have a space to do it that's appropriate. So we have classrooms that have fewer bodies in them. Some of those bodies are adults, so they're much bigger, but that they are fully packed, these classrooms. So it really is representative of, as we've changed over the years, we have less space because we need more space. We need more staff to meet these children's needs. And you know, I guess what I want to close with when I think about these programs in our school um, is that one of the things we know about everybody is that we start building narratives about our lives when we are children, when we are very young. And you build that narrative, you make that story based on the people who are around you. And when I look at this school at Birch Meadow, what I think about is it's not only about we are accepting each other and we are accepting differences, but it's about we're creating a community of children who are creating a narrative. They're going to grow up and they're going to be friends with people who are differently abled with them. And they are going to hire and be hired by people who are differently abled than them. It's because they will have had this experience all their lives of building a narrative where it just makes sense that not everybody can do what you can do. And that some people who may seem to have a limit actually can do more in some ways. So I think it's really important that we have these programs in our schools and that we're supporting them. Good evening, school committee. I'm Sarah Marchant from Coolidge, and thank you to Ms. Stewart and Dr. Doherty for inviting me here tonight. I'll be sharing about our Coolidge special education programs. Um, and also, Coolidge has been in receipt this um, past year of some unanticipated or unplanned resources. And I thought maybe I could also speak towards that and give an example of how those situations do occur in our district from year to year. Um, as well as talk more about our programming. So first and foremost, I don't really feel as if I can speak of special education in isolation. I must mention all of our students and staff because all of our students across all of our buildings have various forms of strengths, needs, and identities. All students bring a special diversity to our buildings and no matter the profile of a student, 
be they receiving special education services or otherwise, we as educators consider all students to be our students. Our goal as educators is to meet the needs of all students to the best of our abilities, structures, and resources. The phrase, it takes a village, is very appropriate when it comes to education. I mention this because while I am talking tonight about special education structures and processes, they do not exist in isolation of general education, and I see this as a real strength of the public school environment, just like Julia was saying as well. So at Coolidge, um, our special education program consists of three learning centers, one at each grade level. We also house four of the five programs in the district. We have the Compass program, which consists of students who have substantially separate programming and severe autism and other specialized needs. We have our Connections program, which is a program for students on the autism spectrum. We have our Crossroads program for students with cognitive deficits, and we have our Therapeutic Support program, which is a program for students with emotional impairment. And while we may have students, as Sharon was saying, we kind of prioritize what, a, what the number one disability may be, students might be put in a program, but we have the ability of using our resources for, to meet the various needs of students across these programs, such as social skill development, pragmatics, um, speech and language, and things like that. So at Coolidge, we have a total of 465 students, 98 of whom um, are on an IEP right now, 44 learning center and 54 programs, that's 21%. Um, we have 10 special education teachers, 20 paraeducators, one counselor connected to the program, a team chair, a speech and language pathologist, and related service providers. So having this mix of programs and type of diversity in our schools is truly a special thing, as students of all learning styles have so much to offer to our learning environments. Our schools are all the richer for this type of diversity. As we know, our goals as educators is to meet the needs of all students. We build educational programming and provide supports to make academic success possible and to build social and emotional capacity for all students. We also strive to create learning environments that allow special education students maximum access to the public school learning environment in the least restrictive way. In the special education process that Sharon spoke of, we balance this dedication towards inclusion where appropriate with also letting student needs drive the structures and supports that we are then required to provide. For general education students, when numbers or needs change, we can almost always absorb these changes with the personnel and structures that we currently have in our buildings. I realize we had an example today of kindergarten and needing more resources, and that happens as well. Um, and it does, to, but we can really anticipate those changes when you're talking about general, general education because we really, it's really based a lot on numbers of students. Um, and we're able to plan for that. For special education, changes in student need and changes in the numbers of students receiving special education services or programming can often be absorbed and included in the staffing and structures that we do have in place. But it's, it is not always as easy in the moment and in planning. Instead, these needs could potentially have an immediate impact on resources, including staffing. This is driven by the IEP team process. If a team decides that a child needs additional services or supports, such as moving from a less restrictive to a more restrictive learning environment, it is our legal ob obligation to respond and to fulfill that need. Every year, I do want to reassure you, our administrative team works so closely with the Director of Student Services, with our team chairs, to learn about the, our next year's population of students. We've already done that this year. We try to understand the needs of our incoming students. We try to plan programming, staffing, spacing, according to all of those needs and budget appropriately. Despite all of our best planning efforts and intentions, our needs for resources can change as student needs change. Um, I'd like to give an example maybe, because I know sometimes that helps, but I know I'm, I usually don't write things down and I kind of go off the cuff, but I'm a little more organized today, so I apologize if I'm going a little longer. But an example at, our, um, at Coolidge is that um, last year we had a program that consisted of one teacher four paraeducators and 10 students. And none of those students were in eighth grade, so we had that same population coming back this year. Um, but to join that population, we, all, we had seven new incoming students. Two were new to the program, meaning they were going from a less restrictive to a more restrictive environment. And of that group of seven, we had, some of those were actually um, substantially sub-separate. So they were actually needing most of their instruction 
in a sub-separate classroom. So that, we all of a sudden didn't quite have the staffing that we knew that new population needed. But one thing we also do as an administrative group is look at the whole and look at where our resources are relative to our students and we really try to move resources to where the needs are. So we felt like we had it very well planned as of the budget process and we had it mapped out and we'd, I we thought at the middle school we would be getting some resources from the feeder elementary school, which all made sense. Um, but a couple of things happened. Those extra two students who came to the program added to our numbers. And in the elementary school, they ended up having other students who then moved from a less restrictive to a more restrictive environment or moved into the district, such as are some examples of how those needs change. And they then needed to keep their personnel to, to, to absorb their growing um, program. So we both basically had growing programs and we both needed to utilize our resources and therein Coolidge needed to advocate for more resources. So that's just an example of um, how these things can happen over time and as much as we do really try to work very hard to anticipate, you know, students change and needs change and, and that is our, our job. Um, certainly there are situations I know people in the district sometimes understand outside placement or not as much but or wonder why that's not an option or is an option and it's certainly very appropriate for certain students but whenever possible and I know you heard this from Julia as well we do all we can to create learning environments and programs to meet the needs of as many students as possible that we can this is a cost benefit to our district but much more importantly it's also a benefit for all of our students to be in the least restrictive environment which a public school is relative to private and in our environment, students with disabilities grow and learn along non-disabled peers. They all have something to teach each other from academics to empathy to inclusion. And this model parallels real life, both here in Reading and beyond. So we want to make this opportunity available to as many students as we can as a school and as a district. So I'm, so, I'm really so very proud of this district and our special education programs and our staff, as well as our general education staff, who again are working hand in hand with special education for all of our students. Um, and I'm so proud of all of our students who make our schools the wonderful places that they are and all of their diversity. So thank you for allowing me this opportunity to speak to you tonight and to share my Coolidge experience. So thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. So some of our numbers in special education are captured here, and this is as of December 28th, 30th? 31st, 31st yes. Yeah. Um, so when I talked about some of the numbers having changed in those two weeks' time, um, that's reflected here, not reflected here as well, but I wanted to mention that the number as of yesterday is different than what you see in this slide. Um, but this does show some of the changes over time that have occurred in, in Reading. Uh, these numbers for the most part are taken from our SIMS reporting as well as our database that we use to track and develop our education programs. The overall percentage in Reading is not that different from the state average, so that's um, remained fairly stable between 16, 17, some odd percent. Um, the overall headcount does not tell the whole story of what we need to do for our children. And I think part of what Julia and Sarah spoke about was why the numbers don't tell the whole story. Sometimes it's the complexity of the needs as well. We have um, greater, when we talk about who's out of district and who's in our schools, you can see that in the 2005-2006 school year, there were 73 students counted as out of district, and that now we have less, there are 62. Um, one might ask why, why if we have more in and less out, why are we spending more money um, than we were back then? You know, apart from just cost of living increases, and a lot of it just speaks to the intensity of the students and the staff that's needed mm -hmm. to ensure they're able to learn, engage, stay a full participant in our schools. 
Um, we talked earlier about some of the performances that go on at the schools in the regular education class center where all of our children are eligible to participate in those and just as they might need support during the school day, during a recess or a lunch or a math class, they need support there as well. And that is part of what we have to provide and support and we're, we're happy to. It gives them the full experience of being a student in the Reading schools. Um, so while our outer districts are down, it, this number doesn't account for all of the children who aren't attending school here in Reading for whom we have to monitor. We do have children who are in schools other than um, special education approved schools whose parents have made decisions that, you know what, I'm going to have my child educated in school X or school Y. Um, they're on an IEP and we still are obligated to follow, monitor them, offer services, hold annual reviews, reevaluate them. Um, and when we get to a point or if we're at a point with a particular team and we can't come to an agreement or the parent isn't in agreement with what we're offering, um, we do still try to work through those differences of opinion. We have um, different dispute resolutions, options available to both the families and the district to help resolve those differences that um, we try to work out. So there are a number of children not captured in these numbers here for whom we're still actively working with the families to try and figure out what's the best approach for the children. And you heard both Julia and Sarah talk about what they call the least restrictive environment and what that um, is commonly referred to in special education is we're required by law to consider that whatever we're going to do for special education, it is done first in the general education classroom and with the general education curriculum. That's our primary obligation to be sure the kids can participate in that. Um, and that means that the children are in all the classes. We are not able to just cluster them all in one classroom and put one teacher from special ed and one regular ed and then we have a class of 24, 25 children, um, half of whom are special ed. That would not be considered a best practice and we're not um, going to employ that kind of practice. So we, the children are spread out amongst our classes so it becomes a staff intensive model. Um, we also pay attention to what's out there in the research. Um, the Commonwealth did commission Dr. Thomas Hayhare out of Harvard for several years in, uh, I think it was 2011 through 2014, to evaluate and assess what's happening in special ed in Massachusetts because our legislators have been hearing from people all over the place parents, school systems, all kinds of advocacy agencies, like you've got to do something different about how we fund special ed. It is a challenge in our commonwealth. Why is it always going up? Um, so he did a three-year study and investigated a lot of that. The reports are available on the department's website. If anybody would like them, I'm, just send me an email. I'm happy to send you the links. Um, and he looked at um, how do children achieve in special ed? And one of his findings was the more time they spend in regular ed, the higher their achievement. Hands down, every child across the board. So that's one of the reasons we look at general ed first. What do we need to do to provide supports and services for those children? Um, he's not the only one to have reached that conclusion. There's studies across the nation similar to that. Um, one of his other findings was around out of district placements versus in district. Um, where where do the children reside who are in these out of district placements? Are there any patterns, anything that we could glean from who these children are? And one of his findings was that children in out of district placements um, outpaced children who lived in communities with a higher socioeconomic average were far more likely to be in an out of district placement than those children from poorer communities. And disabilities have no, um, they're not related to zip code. Mm -hmm. So one would think that it would be relatively comparable. It wasn't. So why, why is that? Um, and you know, it's, there were some conclusions he drew that perhaps <coughs> it's due to the education level of folks in a higher um, income communities, that they are, are better educated, they are better informed, they know how to access services. Um, they also have higher income, so they have the ability to secure additional supports to help them figure out what to do 
for their children, and those supports might be in the form of consultants or advocates, independent testing, um, or the ability to fund, you know, their own decisions as to what they'd like. So that was one of his findings. Um, and he also found that there is uh, evidence to support the impression many educators have that children with emotional needs and disabilities are far more prevalent in our schools today than they were even 10 years ago, and that children are, are being impacted from their emotional impairment at a younger and younger age. So we can have children in our preschools and in our kindergarten and first grade classrooms who are, it's be, they don't have the emotional knowledge yet to be able to control their emotions, their behaviors, their feelings, and um, often they have a communication impairment, which I think Julia mentioned. So how do they communicate what's happening to them? They use their behavior, their actions. It's all communication. So that re often requires a lot of immediate and intensive intervention on our part. So those were some conclusions independent of um, what's happening in Reading that, that Dr. Fahir found in his report to the legislature. So that's part of what influences, it's not just the headcount, it's what our population is bringing to the table these days. Um, so our cost center is our out-of-district programs. You know, they do exist for a reason. There are children who, in fact, need to be educated in a um, highly specialized program. They tend to be students that we would refer to in our world as a low incidence population. There's not a lot of them at a particular age or um, disability type, so they, they have a right to be educated with similar peers as well. So out-of-district programs are an important part. Um, and when, in fact, a team determines that a student is out of district, then we look at those that are approved. There's a very extensive approval process they have to go through with the state to be classified as an um, approved special education school. And we also have what are considered our public day programs. They're run by collaboratives or consortiums. Um, and that's where a number of school districts get together. They jointly operate the collaborative. Reading belongs to both the SEAM collaborative and the Northeast, uh, North sure. East, sure. Uh, North Shore sure. Education Consortium. Um, and they run programs. We have children in both of those collaboratives. There are other collaboratives out there as well that, of course, we can access and do access. Um, and the collaboratives establish their tuitions uh, in working with their boards of directors. That's who establishes their tuitions and what they're able to charge, and their board, dire board of directors are comprised of either school committee or superintendents only. So they are very much an extension of the public schools, and Reading, I believe, has appointed their superintendent to serve on both of the boards. Um, the private schools that are out there, they have to go through an extensive approval process, and how their rates are set is through the state agency called the Operational Services Division, OSD. They typically are allowed um, a polar increase each year, um, somewhere in the 2 or 3 percent range. But once every six years, they're allowed to request what's called reconstruction through the state. And what that means is that they're saying to the state, you know what, our kids have changed. We need different people. We need different services in our schools. And it's going to cost more money. And this is what we think we should be able to charge. Um, and they do. Um, I don't know of any school that doesn't take advantage of that opportunity to request that their rate be substantially increased once every six years. Um, by law, they're also required to notify any of their consumers, which is your public schools, that they are going under this. So we are um, put on notice that they're requesting a rate increase. And then we are able to attend a hearing to hear what they have to say about why they would like that rate increase. Um, Typically, we get 30 days notice, 30 calendar, not school working, but calendar days that this is when the hearing is. If you have anything to say, you can come. Um, it's difficult for people in my role to be free for a whole day, 30 days out. Typically, we're scheduling three weeks out. We're pretty well booked, so it's hard to get there. Um, but if you don't go, the, the approval is pretty much all set. Um, in my career, I've gone to a number of those, 
and it's been quite startling to me what they claim they need. So one example in a private school was they had 20 children more enrolled. They wanted two more nurses. If our nurses were able to add to their staff for every 20 kids, we would have a whole room full of nurses. Um, and, you know, we, I questioned that as to why, in fact, they felt the nursing need would have to increase given that type of an enrollment, and they weren't able to justify it. Um, you know, I had another program say that they felt they needed a full-time ESL teacher and two more counselors. And when I pointed out, geez, your enrollment admission criteria says you will not accept children for whom English isn't their first language, nor will you accept children who have emotional needs and require counseling, so why is it you feel you need that staff? Um, and every question that's asked, the school has to answer either in person right then and there or in writing within 10 days. So it, it helps to be there to ask those questions, but it's difficult. Not everybody can get there. Um, so we're, we're on notice right now. We have public hearings coming up the end of the month on three different schools where some of our students attend. So we're going to try between our team of team chairs to get there to find out why they think they need to reconstruct. But I only give you that level of detail so you have some understanding that these prices are set um, out of our control. It's not, we can't negotiate it. Um, we have um, the private day and the residential programs. We have children in both. Sometimes we have children who start the year or right now, we're like, yep, they're in a day pro program, it's going well, and midway through next year, it has really deteriorated, um, and the child now needs residential. So you can imagine when you go from a program that meets seven hours a day to a program that is seven days a week, 24 hours a day, that it's quite a, an increase. Um, so there's a lot of factors that go into why this cost center is so variable and volatile. One of the other factors that we're always, um, that every district struggles with is that the foundation budget formula that was established a couple decades ago, which is really quite complicated. Mm -hmm. I think there's only three people in the state that understand it. Um, underfunded special ed, day one. Grossly. Not just by a couple hundred thousand dollars, millions. So that has compounded this funding deficit for decades. Um, I just heard on the news last week they have another commission to take another look at it and they, they made that attempt seven or eight years ago and it, it kind of crumbled at the end. I think it just is, um, it's difficult to wrap your, your head around how do you make those changes. Now Reading doesn't rely tremendously upon that itself because of the, the local resources. However, what you need to understand is if the state is having trouble with this, they, they don't have the flexibility for other funds to help districts in other ways where we might want to be innovative, be creative, start some programs, seed money to start programs has, has disappeared. Um, you know, 18 years ago, um, the district I worked in at the time, we were able to apply for a competitive grant to help support the education of kids with autism. They only funded 10 districts. We were one of them. Um, and that was supposed to be a five-year grant. It dried up after three years. And it's like, okay, you're on your own. So we were, we had to scramble and figure out how to fund it. But that kind of money is gone. Professional development money is gone for special ed. It's just not coming this way anymore. So that's, that's why if the foundation formula can be adjusted to some degree, it'll help us in other ways, in, a, in an indirect way. Um, so we have a recommended budget within here. It is a, a big portion. I um, completely understand why it is and that there's only so much money to go around. So if this piece gets bigger, another piece has to shrink. Um, every conversation I have with uh, educators in the district, certainly with Gail and Chris and John over the past three months, I think, however long it's been. <laughs> um, <laughs> I am always conscious of if I ask, someone else has to be denied. So I just want the community to understand that this is not, um, not necessarily a frivolous ask and one that we haven't thought through in a painstaking way around what we need to operate our special education department. Um, but my, 
my role within this school district is to ensure that our students with special needs have their needs met. Um, so I'm, I'm required to advocate for that <laughs> and, and feel passionately about it. Um, so our increase includes some of what's included in the Gen Ed side of the budget relative to staff increases and what is needed there for bargaining, uh, the collective bargaining agreements and or non-represented non personnel. Um, we have our behavioral health coach is part of our budget for next year. Um, we have legal services, which I do want to point out is not just special education. It is for student services overall, if we kind of remember the umbrella of our department. Um, so there's a lot of legal consult that goes on that is not special education related. Um, and I think that this increases just to try and get us aligned with some of the past spending that's been required. And we do have some known increases, you know, so the, the fact certain students as to what we knew back in December when we put this together were in there, um, are part of this. Uh, we have our professional development being restored, part of what had to occur over the summer in order to fund some of the staff that Julia and Sarah spoke about that were, were needed, were essential, is had to reduce or eliminate some of the other special education line items so it is not reasonable to think that we wouldn't have professional development restored um, and beyond so I spoke about the legal already okay So this gives you some sense of the different similar to the the regular Red Cross Center. Um, where the money goes. So we have our salaries, professional, our clerical, other services, other salaries, thank you, the paraprofessionals, contracted services, that includes our um, partnership program with the Wakefield Public Schools for our 18 to 22 year olds, um, called our post program other expenses and then then we have our total which is a 7.4 percent increase overall so some of this detail I believe also mirrors what's in the budget book yes yes, yes it does an eye chart thank you it sure is for me and it, it's reflected primarily the paraeducators and the teachers is where the increases are and the behavioral health On to questions right away, Mr. Robinson. <laughs> the chart that shows the uh, number of students on IEP. So that's page 32? Yeah, it's not yep. a number. So oh, it's a slide. It's a question. This one here. I don't know the one over time? <coughs> the, this one, yes. No, yeah, page. Whether we can show this or not, but I'd be curious a uh, couple things how that, like, just take this year for an example, or 18 to 19, what, how, what, what's in each program? We just got the aggregate number there of 752, how that's split out by the different programs. Mm -hmm. And I'd also be interested to know, we have students that are on IEPs that are just using the learning center Correct. they're not in a pro I'd be interested in those how who those are and that uh, the reason it, it kind of just tracks with the staffing for the different programs mm -hmm. in the learning centers uh, there is a part of your part I of your answer to find that chart I look yeah, for part of your answer is uh, part of your answer is on page 33 that's yeah, right. it's not the full answer but the only one that you can figure out is the post program is that the right. chart you're talking about yeah, yeah. so because there's one so yeah we we have had that chart in the past and that, um, i think that's important yep. to be able to track uh the staffing in the different programs oh right just run that chart by program and a school across versus well, yes, yes. Yeah. Part, part of the yeah. challenge of putting that chart yeah. together yeah. is that you have students in multiple yeah. programs in the same building Right. So it, it, it's not it's not as easy as a student is in this program versus this program. Like at, at Coolidge, for example, there are students who use the services of 
sometimes all four of the yeah. programs that Sarah has at that school. Yeah. So that's the tricky part of, it's, it's like of the trying to create a chart like that. Oh, it's like the athletic numbers where you have students yeah. taking multiple sports. Mm -hmm. Right. I have been trying to gather that data, and um, it is a moving target. I don't think it was as uh, clear-cut, perhaps, as in the past. I think Julia talked about her 20 and a half and her 14 and a half. And so that, that would have been the, hi the hybrid? The hybrid. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I think there are more so, hybrid students than perhaps in the past. All right, so then I, I would be interested to know, of Test those numbers, center. what are just solely there are a lot of kids on IEPs that are just using the learning center yeah. because of they That's need good. extra test yeah. time or mm -hmm. that would be right and even know. our learning center children their needs change over time as well so at the elementary level for example students in the learning center often receive explicit reading instruction um, they have writing instruction. Yeah. They might need math instruction. So there's some content-based instruction as well. I understand. Yeah. I, yeah and but at the, yeah. the high school, it's more um, academic support-like. So I guess. Yeah, I can keep I working on that. I yeah, we'll do, we'll do our best. To I have some it. other questions, yeah. but I'll only ask one now, but just because uh, yeah. I give other people yeah. time. But just if you can go to that, that last chart that, the one that was more densely populated yet? No, no, I'm sorry, the last one that had the bullets. Uh, the back one. That one? Uh, mm -hmm. Next one. There. Well, I, I know what it, anyway, so you, we talked about the, the uh, six year uh, adjustment, uh, we'll call it. Yep. And I guess I'll make a comment. When I look at that, and I, he I say all hands on deck. I don't care whether you can't get there or so somebody needs to be there with the talking points uh, that we need to get. So and, we, and it's not, we can't have, oh, we couldn't get to the, and I'm not directing that at you. I, just, I understand, yeah. Uh, that, that to me is just, I mean, that's a, pro and that, that's a problem that was created by the state legislators so yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but people have to be someone has to be there representing and you know we may end up with whatever it is they say they but we need to get our points out there. right right we need to understand what's going going into their ask and sometimes the requests are legitimate we see children change in I our agree. schools it yeah. wouldn't be unusual but some of the asks are not appropriate and one of the things the department has done um, in the past couple of years is they will allow you to participate um, by phone, by conference. Oh. Previously, you had to physically be present. Um, they also moved these hearings to the Department of, of Education, which for us is convenient because it's Malden. Malden. Um, but, you know, because they used to be at the school. So you could have a student who's in a school down in Brewster on the Cape so you're you're talking a whole whole day <laughs> um, and then some for a one hour meeting um, and they don't like it when you ask a lot of questions and push the meeting out but I agree so we we're you know I'm working with the team we chairs and we are putting together a list of questions we want to ask and have answered as well as who ca who can participate even if it's through the phone conference can I, I just want to ask a follow-up on that though I, I mean I've um, so what's the success rate, though, of the districts, the districts <laughs> who attend and provide the feedback, and if the placement is asking for a 36% increase, what's the, does OSD really reduce that to 34%? I mean, what are, what are the outcomes? I, I, I don't, I, my knowledge is that it's not always that fruitful. But it is, it varies. Okay. It has been my personal experience in participating in a number of those conferences. So I was at one, um, one hearing and asked questions, and the school did end up getting a significant increase. Um, I don't think it was as high as they had asked, but it was still significant. Um, I was at another where um, I was not alone. There were probably a dozen other people in my role, and the school withdrew their request because they had to answer so many questions 
um, and I think in the end felt like, you know what, we can make it work with what we have. Okay. So, and it ranges everything in between. Yeah, to Ms. Robinson's point, it's, we, we need to be there, yeah. and we need to make, and hopefully other districts are making it a similar priority. Yes, I, I usually talk it up with my colleagues yeah. whenever I have the opportunity, and we'll share the letters, you know, because we may not have a child at School X right now that's going through reconstruction, so we'd have no idea, but we might next year have the child there. Right. So, you know, we, we need to collaborate and, mm -hmm. and work on that. Dr. Doxa? First of all, thank you for this very inclusive um, presentation. It's yeah. really helpful. Thank you. Um, one of the questions that's sort of haunting me is that I know, I think it was last year there was the requirement introduced, and I think it was with the IDEA grant. Proportionate that, share? Yes. Proportionate, proportionate share. Proportionate share. Yeah. Where is that in these numbers, and are they still enforcing that? Yes, it's yeah. still a um, federal requirement that we expend. <coughs> um, the way they calculate what's called our IDEA money, which is the federal entitlement grant money that um, I referenced that they were supposed to be funding when they first put the law into place 45 years ago that, oh, we'll give you 40% of whatever it cost from the federal government. They've only funded that. I think the highest level they've ever funded is 17%. 17? 17%. Because they, they had the caveat that, you know, um, if appropriations oh, yeah. um, can, can do it. So anyway, the IDEA grant is an entitlement grant, um, however, it it doesn't even come close to meeting the needs. But the, do, the way they determine how much money Reading is going to get is based on a headcount of residents. There's a portion of our free and reduced lunch figures that go into that calculation. And then they also count the headcount of students who attend schools in Reading, regardless of their residence. So um, Reading's largest private school is Austin so Prep. Prep. So children who have educational programs that have been developed by their school, their town of residence, so let's just say they live in Wakefield, um, and they go to Austin Prep. Wakefield had to identify them as needing an IEP, proposed an IEP, and the parents said, you know what, we're, we're going to Austin Prep, thanks, but no thanks. But now they're on the Reading headcount. We are supposed to be providing support services to children who attend private schools with IEPs with the dollars we receive from the federal government for Reading. And it, that proportionate share is calculated on the number of students who are enrolled at Austin Prep who have current IEPs. So that gets recalculated each year based on their numbers of children and um, our numbers. So we're working with Austin Pep Prep to try and put together some student services plans. It, <coughs> it is different from an IEP. It is not an individual entitlement service for the proportionate share like an IEP is, but we have to expend X number of dollars. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, there's, um, they're hiring an executive function speaker to come in, which would be very beneficial for their students with IEPs, uh, March 25th. So I'll be sharing that out there with folks uh, that evening. If you're interested in that, mark it on your calendar and <laughs> stay tuned. Um, through our proportionate share dollars, um, we have some assistive technology consultation available to the school to help students with disabilities through um, our assistive technology consultant, Erin King. So those are just a couple examples. It, it is a requirement. It hasn't gone away. So that is within the IDEA grant itself. It is not within, it's not, not in budget. It's not in our budget. It's not Thank you. local funded. And also one of the other parts too that we get asked a lot is we do not give physically give them the money. They have to do everything through, through us. us. We contract it. We pay for it. So we control it. But it's it comes it comes off the top of the grant. So we use our administrative resources yes. and yes, we do. staffing to at do times. That. Yep. Provide yep. all that service. Mm -hmm. We do with we our dollars. Not, We're required we can't to calculate that towards our proportionate share. Okay, and it comes out of the grant. If you're looking at the back of the, the budget, right. it would not, be not uh, not the, this budget. Right, the talking. IDA grant yeah, money. It would be. Right, yeah. So good question. Okay. Thank you. Any another question? Or? We have another question. Okay. Go, ahead. Go ahead. Go okay. ahead. Okay, thanks. Um, I know I see that the um, behavioral health coach mm -hmm. is within the special ed budget. Can yeah. you talk a little bit about the function of that coach? Is it solely you, we've heard a lot about the collaboration between Reg Ed and Special Ed and how it 
the programs only work when our teachers are working together and our families right. are working together. And so I'm seeing this behavioral coach and hearing how all kids have needs um, and wondering if you could talk a little bit about how that coach goes across how their job addresses the needs of both gen ed and special. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll let um, Chris speak to it more because she has more of a, a history than me, but I just want to say that in order to do a good job in special ed, part of the special ed regs require we do pre-intervention supports, this pre-referral process, so I, I believe that the behavioral health coach works um, a lot in our, our gen ed classrooms with our gen ed teachers providing support coaching. She also oversees all of what we're, again, another legal requirement um, that we have to have staff trained in um, de-escalation techniques and if needed, physical intervention techniques. Um, and she provides that training, tracks all that training, um, which is really quite a um, data intensive job. Um, and I don't know if you want to speak about it. So as you know, um, through our school transformation grant, we've done a really uh, big job before that and then during the process of really spending a lot of time and resources on multi-tier systems of support. So she's a big part of that and that resource is available to everyone. So principals call on her uh, for behavioral support or consult, work with families. Sometimes she works directly with families. Um, she does a lot of training as um, Sharon said some of it is required training then we also do as you know um, we train every employee in the Reading Public Schools on youth mental health she does all of that training for all of our new staff um, she she organizes our trauma informed training which we have had great success with she also does a lot of data keeping as far as um, state regulated um, data points that they're looking for as far as around behavioral concerns. We have to report on them monthly and then annually and so she collects all of that. She does um, parent training which this year she's done a nice job of working with the RISE preschool and having regular parent training sessions. Um, we also uh, had a, a, a training for middle school to talk about uh, the reproductive health unit. Um, so we're, we're, it's really a multi-tiered system of support for teachers, for administrators, for parents, and of course the ultimate goal is to work with students. Um, she doesn't do a lot of direct service work, mostly observing, evaluating, and giving support to teachers or staff members um, as far as next steps. This is something we could try. We also, as you know, have two BCBAs in the district, so she works in concert with them. In fact, they share an office. Their home base is, an, is, is a shared office. So. Um, she, she currently is on maternity leave. Uh, she just had baby number two, Rocco. Um, but she will be back in uh, February and she'll be back on, she literally got everything organized uh, for these two months while she would be gone. And we'll be back on that. Um, and we're rolling out more training as we speak. We're um, going to have her participate in more behavioral health training to our teachers so that they can really support students. I just, can I just clarify on this? So is that position on page, in figure 21, page 36, or not? I just want to. It's the, it's the um, point six. On page 36? Yeah, where, okay. where, oh, I'm trying to look, I'm looking at the text on page 30. Um, it's called the District Administrator Student Support, uh, support Services. Services. Okay, I, I just wanted to clarify, that's what I thought. So that behavioral health yep. coach is that. District Administrator of Support Services. Thank you. Mr. Bobby, you had some questions? Yeah, a few comments and questions. Could we go to the uh, chart that shows the enrollment over time for special ed? Two slides, Matt. The first one. Which is figure 18? <coughs> yeah, it's figure 18 in the budget book. There, there we go. So, First question is just about the student population. So there's two representations of student population. There's a number of students in IEP and presumably a subset of those who are out of district, right? So everybody who's out of district is also on an IEP? Correct. Do I understand that? Okay. So when I go down the column of the number of students, which is the grand total, right, 
I see seven years, if I counted right, where there are increases in the number of students over a previous year, right? And I see six years where there are decreases. How did decreases happen? And are you talking about the total number or the students out of district? Which column? Total number. The total number. So children, I did mention that they are reevaluated once every three years as a minimum, and at that time they have to requalify. So at times children exit special education at that time, and they don't remain on an individual IEP. Um, there's also children who move, move out of the district as well as children who move in. So that would be the, the best explanation I would have for why those numbers change. In students that graduate. Yeah, so there's graduation or aging out. There's moving out, and there's reevaluating out. Right. Mm -hmm. Do you have any sense of what proportion of each of those, you know, kind of an aggregate in your time looking at? I know it's been short I in can, the Reading District. But. I can certainly look into that and see if I can dig up some of that data. Some of what I've found in some of my data research that I've been doing since I've been here is it's, um, it's been difficult sometimes to figure out how numbers have been counted in the past. Right. Um, and even when I was running reports earlier in the year, as I've delved into some of those numbers, it's like, well, wait a minute, that child's double counted. Mm -hmm. so, um, so I mentioned what we call our next IEPs. Sometimes right. you have a child who's in both states. They have an active IEP, they're getting services, and there's a new one proposed. Okay. So that if the numbers weren't run with the right filters, the child might show up twice. So um, the more I delve into the numbers, the more I, I, I see areas that I want to dig a little deeper. Yeah, and to, uh, so to I can look into that and hopefully be able to provide a reasonable guesstimate. For I, I, I wouldn't ask for There's a lot that we ask the administration to do. That's I, I just okay. wanted to get a sense of it. I'm not asking for you to do more work on that one. Um, this I response would, my, is fine. My guess would be based on my prior experiences in other districts, not right. reading specific, is that most of the children exit in grade 12. Yes. Out of that's those three uh -huh. categories, that's uh -huh. probably yeah. the most. Where the most of the change. Yeah. So we could also just look at the change in, yeah. in 12th graders and yeah. kind of, yeah. yeah. It's, it's not critical. If you have a smaller class coming in, in yeah. kindergarten and first grade, then went out, then your numbers could right. be smaller right. for I, that I just, just wanted to get a sense that there there is a, you know, we are, looking closely at the reevaluation process and that we're optimizing that for students and getting yes. it right for that student and that there are some students who, who whose needs change in a way that is less resource intensive mm -hmm. and that we're okay, we don't have kids on cruise control we're really paying attention to how kids are doing every year and, we are. And so we might or have at least every whatever the appropriate period is three years I guess is what you said for the testing every year you have to look at their program right. every three years right. you have to test and requalify so I, I, I'm just making sure that pushing on that a little bit to make sure that that's being done and it sounds like it is. Um, out of district and that subpopulation there, so I mean just numbers don't tell the story here, right? Um, completely. Numerically it's easy to see that the number 62 is fairly close to what it was 10 years ago. You know, 59, 51, it's bounced mm -hmm. around. We don't have any numbers in the 70s since, you know, 2000 FY8, right? But there's no guarantee in the future that it couldn't change. Is I, and I, I'm, I guess I'm, I, I'm a little bit confused by that and, and, and the question that Chuck asked about when we, when we turn the page and we look at figure 19 in the budget book and we see the number of students in special education program by school and then the number of like in-house programs that we heard um, the principals talk about tonight that you talked about, right? Are these in-house programs that we've developed, the Crossroads, Compass, Connections, everything listed in figure 19, is a, are, are they at all connected to trying to reduce or change the number of out-of-district placements? Because the number hasn't changed, but the FTEs that we use to support these programs has changed. Are they connected or are they, are they not intended to be connected? I would say that there is a connection for some of the students that okay. if we did not have some of these more district-wide intensive staff programs, the children would then require an out-of-district program because of the types of services, the level of services that they need. If we don't provide it here, they're still entitled to receive it. So they need, we would then have to look at the collaborative programs or the private um, school programs. And um, we still, even with the programs we have, there's you know, families who make decisions that I'm still gonna opt into an independent school for my child's education. Um, so the number we don't see there is the number that you might see in the absence of right. what we've invested in and built. Correct, and, right. and, and often 
when a program is started or initiated where someone in my position might say to the superintendent and to the CFO, um, you know, I'm seeing a change in population. I'm seeing this cluster. I have five students with ASD leaving the preschool, going to kindergarten next year, and I don't see a program that's going to meet their needs. We need right. to plan for it. This is what it should look like. And, you know, there's then a presentation typically to the school committee to get approval to move forward with a new program. And you're, you're doing a cost analysis there. If we don't do it here, this is what it might cost there. But over time, it, it, you often don't continue to track what is the cost impact if we didn't have these programs. Right. So those numbers would be greater. So I'm, I'm grateful you asked that question because we lose sight of that sometime. And it's not just the cost benefit that we do the programs for, it's the educational benefit as well. We have much tighter quality control when we educate in-house. Um, we can be much more flexible in meeting the kids' needs um, rather than the private school that has to wait six years to get the right staff right. as their kids change. So um, is it okay if I yeah. kind of on a roll? Go ahead. <laughs> so the other column, so the percentage of students on IEPs then versus yeah. the state doesn't really tell the whole story either is what I'm hearing because it doesn't speak to the particular um, <laughs> nature of the needs that these students have. You can't just count them and say they're all, well, 752, right. 724 and say, well, that's more, more or less need. It's just more or less individuals who have a need that requires support and the nature of those supports can change. So even though we're somewhat, I would say, in line with the state averages, sometimes a little below, um, that doesn't, these numbers don't somehow capture or, or score in any quantitative way uh, what the specific needs are of these specific individuals. That's an and, accurate right. observation. Okay. So um, I want to pick up on Mr. Robinson's point earlier about the in-house in programs, if you would, the crossroads, compass, connections, um, et cetera. So do we, the, the, I, I was actually interested, Mr. Robinson, the opposite of your question. So you asked about student enrollment in each of the programs. I was interested in the FTEs supporting the programs, which is kind of, you know, well, what do we put into the program as opposed to who's receiving the program? I said that. Did you, okay, well, yeah, you're I'm still interested in it. <laughs> directed something we can I just make a quick observation on so the I don't my only concern with the, the your last question about the uh, you know the out of district numbers relative so I go back to John you can probably answer this in two thousand seven we only had one in district program. Yeah we had we had much fewer programs so, then. Those numbers aren't coming down because of the programs we're adding. I, I don't think there's any correlation at all. No, and, and, and that I was trying to understand that, right, that we've, we've built these programs over about the same time period we see on these, these uh, this chart, but we don't may go up. Uh, they could yeah, have been have higher, programs. but yeah. they, well, are, they, haven't, they haven't stayed flat because oh, we've right. added programs. And, and, and what I thought of was that what we don't know is what the number would be in the absence right. of that. If, I if, if we didn't build these programs, we don't if, know what that number would if have If I could speak to the point do, yeah. you made and the question you asked. So similar to the challenge of students being sometimes in multiple programs, we have staff, staff that serve multiple right. programs yeah. in a building. And Coolidge, I'm going to go back to Coolidge again. And have, I've had many conversations with Sarah about, mm -hmm. you know, when the staffing requests are coming in, where is this staff person going? Mm -hmm. And she said, well, period one, two, and three, the yeah. staff member is going to be in it's this divided, program, yeah. and three, four, five in this program. And so that's, that's difficult to quantify where the I, FTEs are going for each program. Yeah, and, and, and I guess help me understand the, the dual enrollment idea. So if we look at, so if we took Learning Center out, so it, does it work that students may be in, let's say, one of the Crossroads Compass Connections, uh, Bridge, TSP, um, and Learning Center, right? Imagine that's a not uncommon pairing. I guess my question is, other than if you take Learning Center out of that discussion, are there students cross-enrolled, and maybe you can't tell me this, it's just a yes or no question, not a how many question, but are there students enrolled in multiple programs that are listed above post in that list of below figure 19? Yes. There are, okay. And then there are, 
FTE allocated to multiple programs or fractional FTE it, allocated? Yes, yes. Okay. And I, I guess I'd be interested in like the aggregate of, of all of it. Would it be possible to, if we ask the question in writing for, to provide an aggregate of how many total FTE go into this program, how many total students are in, in enrolled in all of these programs seven together? Programs. Is that calculatable or is it split with other? We could probably come up with some reasonable numbers, but it wouldn't tell the uh, whole story. Yeah, you're answering my question with your <laughs> my, my concern of doing reaction. that the is that right it's, it's, a, it's a number that's going to continue to change. Right. And then it's, it's a number that's going to be out there and people are going to point to it and then say, well, you said. <laughs> right. No, it's fair. And it probably changes within a year even when you And I'm not, it. the amount of staff hours to put that together. No, it's, it's, you've answered my question. This is easier to have this dialogue than ask questions that you have time unnecessarily. Um, this slide with the Special Education Cost Center by FTE. Could we go to that one, please? Um, slide 75, I think. Next one. Thank you. Um, so. It's figure 21. Right. Yep. Thank you. So the students, so if I compare the slide we just left, which is figure 18, I believe, right? And I look at. 19. Uh, no, I'm in 18, oh, 18. 18 in yep. the budget book versus okay. this. So what I'm looking yep. at is, did the student population served go up or down? And then did the FTEs go up or down with that? Right. So when student population is going up, are FTEs going up? When student population goes down, do FTEs go down? The answer to the second question is no. no. The answer to the second question is most definitely no because it depends on the needs of the, the individual student. child. Right. You could have a decrease. In numbers. I'm going to point to Sarah, when Sarah was talking about it. You may have students leaving, and one of the best examples is you could have students leave it that are on IEPs leaving each of the elementary schools. I could have five students leaving elementary going to middle school with absolutely no change in the elementary school, but additions at the middle school. Okay. Because if you look at the amount of hours that would change from a teacher or a para for one student leaving versus five students coming in it, it's it's not you can't look at it that way so it really is a student by student need by need analysis no that makes a lot of sense so you've had student populations 17 18 19 go down down up and then we've had the FTEs go up 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 yes so. Can really be tied to the intensity of the need of the student population that is making that up and where they're coming from and going to also impacts that. I mean, I see that. I also see the continuous climb of that first line over 16, 17, 18, yep. 19, 20, right? Yes. While the enrollment's gone up and down. I can give you a, another example, which I've used a couple of times in conversations um, with some of the town uh, officials is that next year uh, we have 40 RISE students on IEPs going to kindergarten, which is a very high number. Mm -hmm. It's right. one of the higher numbers, Kelly, I believe, that we've had in a while. Most of the time, those students are going to two schools, Woodend and Birch Meadow, to the programs, uh, which is what you heard Julia say, that she's getting staffing increases next year and her program continues to grow. But we're also seeing those students go to other schools that may not necessarily have uh, programs or, or staffing right now that can, that can service those students. So Barrows, for example, we're adding a staff member at Barrows next year because they have a, a number of students going from RISE on IEPs to Barrows. So, but in RISE, we can't move staff from RISE right. to those schools because we've got three-year-olds coming in that need that staffing. So. Well, and, and the students at different ages are different right. skill sets, right, too. So you w might not want to do that. I, I think I'm just looking for an assurance that we talk a lot about the dollars, and I also want to ask questions about the time to make sure that collectively we, as you know, people that are being as wise as we can be about investing other people's money in our, our students and our, our um, administration, that we do that in a way that is respectful of the time these FTEs as they grow as well as the money. And, and it sounds like all of that is so occurring. I just want to ask the questions. Items mm -hmm. that we do, which most, I think all the principals can attest to it, we've spent <laughs> countless hours meeting individually and as a group. Mm -hmm. um, 
Iowa Fish Iron has been instrumental on that where we, and I always point out Julia because she is near and dear to my heart with her Excel spreadsheets. We went person by person, grid by grid, and looked at exactly who was where, where they were moving, what we could move, and we honestly sat there and said, oh, we can move 15 para hours from Birch Meadow to Coolidge, we can move X to Y, so we spent, we met with every single mm -hmm. principal team chair and went person by person for what we know in any instances where we had groups moving, we looked to move staffing with them, but also had to be cognizant of situations where the population coming up differed from the population leaving. So I, we spent, that was probably the biggest piece of putting this budget together was going through every staffing scenario. That's I'm very glad to hear that. Yeah, very student specific. You know, the, the resources follow the student as mm -hmm. the student moves along. Okay. Um, and then just in just the rise preschool alone, the numbers of children moving up to kindergarten, it's a big difference when you go from a half day preschool or even a full day preschool to kindergarten. Mm -hmm. So what we need to do for resources. Last question on slide 2074. This is the same slide we're on? No, it's the dollar slide. This is the time slide. What'd you say, 73? 74, 74. I think it's the previous one. The previous one, the legal. Yeah. Yeah. The legal so the, the bottom line, right, oh. so my math could be off here, but if I just look at that bottom row, left to right, that, that 7% is pretty much year over year over year, right? right. You know, if we had a 10% jump from 18 to 19. Mm -hmm. Maybe the override was part of, maybe we made some, some cuts to get 7% out of 17 to 18. We replenished them in 18 to 19, but, you know, our FinCom guidance is not growing at 7%. Mm -hmm. Right, and I know this is a small, much smaller part of the budget, but it is a part of the budget growing much, much faster than, and for, for all the reasons we've talked about, and, and not saying that shouldn't be as it is. I think that's something we all need to look in, into and ask our questions about and evaluate, but this is a high growth area, as you point out, and I appreciate the diligence, Ms. Stewart, that you're applying to this. It's, it's in a short period of time, you, you really have yeah. dug in very like quickly. Data analysis. <laughs> so we, we appreciate that you know, what, what you bring to this on, on very, very short notice and getting up to speed on, you know, over 700 IEPs and out of district placements is really remarkable. But, really good. you know, th th this continued kind of doing absolutely everything we can for these students and making sure that the resources are optimally allocated and only asking for what the students need. It's really important in a high growth area that's going to get a lot of focus on the funding side. Mm -hmm. And it's something that's going to be something we're going to need to manage without you know, kind of, and I like that we had this night set up with the regular day and the, and the special mm -hmm. ed kind of together because those are, that's well. total, total student population. And as you point out, we're here to serve all the students and, and do it in, in a way that's mindful of resources. So I, I, think, I think the high growth is driven by factors we can't control, student need, we can't control transportation costs, maybe we can negotiate um, contracts and so forth, but we have to keep the contracts we have and there's a certain price to transportation. And then the uh, out of district placements, which are reset every six years, and we should participate in that process where we can. I like the phone idea, dialing up and <laughs> giving our comments and, and trying to do whatever we can to force service providers to justify their cost increases, but at the same time meet our students' needs. So yeah. I like what I've heard. Thanks. We, we go over all of the contracts with our um, out of district placements. While they set the rate, we have to establish an individual contract with each of them. and. Um, I went over them with a fine tooth comb. I added language. I added things to them to make them more accountable for what they're doing. Um, got pushback on some and said, you know what, We're, this, is, this is what business is like for us in Reading schools. The kid's going to go to school and you're going to tell us if he's not. You know, you're going to give us a phone call. It's not going to be an, e it's not gonna be a day, an attendance sheet 30 days later where he missed 23 out of 30 days. It's not going to operate that way anymore. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, we've been very diligent mm -hmm. in trying to balance. It's, it's, an, it's a, a funky part of education where we are obligated to serve the needs of children who learn differently. Mm -hmm. And it is, um, it costs money because it is staff intensive. <coughs> but you know what? It's the right thing to do. Right. And these children will grow up to be very productive citizens in Reading and whatever communities they settle in. Um, Reading is a highly desirable community for people to move to a lot of that reason being the school department. 
So you have a lot of people coming to this community for a lot of reasons, and that means you have the whole spectrum coming mm -hmm. to the community. Um, and we're always balancing the needs of the student against the needs of the, the taxpayer. We are, we are spending tax dollars. I, we understand that. We get it. We are diligent in, in um, our obligation to do that wisely and, and only in a manner that's required, and that's the right thing to do. Um, our team chair people are, are high quality, highly educated, experienced people. They, they work through this process with their staff every, every day. And we meet on a weekly basis. We talk about what are the challenges, what are you seeing, what can we do differently so that we have some commonality and uniformity about our practice. Um, I, I like data analysis. I like systems analysis. So that's one of my goals between now and June is to try to be sure we have systems in place that are sustainable um, in the way that we examine and look at children um, so that there's, it uh, doesn't matter if you're at the barrels or the kill them, you're going to have a similar experience as to how this works out. Mm -hmm. And I would say we're also making sure, in addition to all of the wording changes and making sure the agreements, we then, when we receive the invoices, whether it's yeah. the transportation yeah. invoice, which is 20, 30 pages yeah. a month, or it, <laughs> it is reviewed student by student, day by day, rate by rate, to make sure that everything in there and every month we're going back and challenging and questioning and yeah. getting credit. So it is a labor intensive yeah. process where we're making sure right you charge us for 17 days our attendance has 15 the child was there why we get charged for those two days mm. um, so we, we are being very diligent about that thank you Ms. Brosky. sort of a global comment if that's okay um, I just really appreciated the approach tonight um, it's, a it's daunting because 7.4% to Mr. Bobbin's point is a is a lot of money Absolutely. and not sustainable and not within our current funding. So <laughs> it's a very problematic situation we're in. But what I, what I like and appreciate about what happened tonight, particularly hearing from the principals, is a real explanation. I, I think of all the areas of education, this is probably the one where there's the greatest opportunity to educate yeah. parents, mm -hmm. taxpayers, residents, town meeting members, and the broader public about um, how special education works. It's highly complex highly regulated. Um, I was looking through these numbers. The, the overall goes up a million dollars. What percentage of that is out of district placement? What percentage of that is FTE increases? And it, it's like a third out of district place, um, out of district tuition increases, a third roughly FTE increases and salary increases, um, and 20% is increased pairs, which is also staffing. So what's frustrating about that, but what matches the narrative that we heard is it isn't one driver. It isn't out of district expenses. It isn't we're hiring too, you know, a bunch of new teachers. It isn't one driver. It's the entire enterprise across is growing at this, this kind of rate, um, which is just frustrating, but mirrors what we heard from the principals, which is that the programs are growing. The needs are becoming more intense. So, um, so that was a very helpful way to explain it. That's really all I wanted to say. Thank you, Ms. Kowalski. Ms. Robinson? So I have a question on the uh, the legal services. So you, in the narrative, uh, it, it says that we're restoring them back to the, similar to what we've done with other line items, restored it back to the 17 to 18 years. I guess I'm not real comfortable with that without knowing uh, what have we, because it's a big number. Uh, and what have we, what's current year actual uh, at versus what we have in the budget now? And do we really need to, to do that? Uh, just to say we, we, we went back to those old, old uh, hist historical years. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you asked that question because I did have it in my notes but didn't speak to it in the detail I had prepared, which is, um, in order to come up with what do we think we need for that particular line item, I looked at, at where we are in our actuals. I also looked at what is the number of IEPs that we have that are in current disagreement or dispute so that we may need some legal advice to help moving forward. I also took a look at um, the, the number of discipline questions that we typically need some um, input from our legal counsel on and, and just in the short time I've been here there's been um, 
I don't know whether to call it a high number because I can't have a reference point being this my first year here. I think it's I think it's a little bit higher than I think a little bit higher. Yeah. So yeah. it's um, you know probably a weekly phone call to consult. Sometimes it includes a record review, you know, as well that the the attorney may say I'd like to see the records on this particular incident. So that that's all kind. Um, so I, I base that calculation on looking at the number of areas that were in current disagreement, what our, our actuals to date have been around discipline, training, needs, and then multiplied that out to, uh, to get to June and into next year. Because it does take time sometimes to work out programs that are, there isn't agreement, and, and it's not unusual for that to then go into the next year to work things out. Um, so that's part of where the, the dollars came from, and of course working with Gail on prior year actuals. And yep. one of the items that we looked at is historically we have kept it at the $80,000 budget, Less and we have done transfers from regular education into special ed oh. for three years to cover the shortfall. So we're also trying to look at items where historically we have had to do No, transfers. and I understand you said that earlier about another, uh, I guess, yeah. When the school committee budget comes out, I'd like to see that narrative a little more robust than just we went, you know, su some add some of the points that Sharon that I just uh, mentioned. Yeah. Okay. Uh, in there. I, I uh, think um, just building on that, that because this is, I think, another item where we, as we just talked about, where um, that was increased throughout the year. So this number, these numbers in 17 and 18 were not originally 146 or 127, right? Those, because that's the actual expenditure, so they were transfers. And maybe just, um, I mean, not everywhere, but maybe at least the ones that we've just talked about, there could be just some just asterisk to say that this, there was a transfer um, potentially on that, you know, for a couple of items. I'm not asking you to go back through it, but at least there were this one and one other one we talked about tonight where part of the, Part of the explanation of the large increase was um, that there, there had also been transfers. And what you're trying to do now is budget for an amount that is Actual. more realistic rather than the lower amount and then you know, recognize we, we, we keep doing this transfer thing, although we didn't last year, evidently. So I just had one other yeah. question. So my, my other question was, uh, I didn't see it in here, and it may be I, uh, I missed. Uh, what do we? What type of guidance is there for uh, circuit breaker at this point? Where does that show up in here? I didn't see it. Circuit breaker is part of accommodated costs. I knew. Okay. So it's um, the net number. So the way that works is out of district transportation and tuition are part of the accommodated costs. So we are. What percentage though are we using? We are using fact certain because we have circuit breaker year in reserve. So for next year, we are using FY 19 in FY 20. So we're, we know how much circuit breaker we have. It's a little bit higher. There are about 68 to 70. There are yeah. Last so. year they increased it. They were hoping to get to 72 percent, but they're not there. Yet. Yeah, I think it's about 70. So the one fortunate aspect we have is we actually budget circuit breaker fact certain, and then we have any potential upside if they go from the 68 to the 70 or the 72 percent. Thank you. So I, I have the same question. Where, so circuit breaker is not here. It's part of the accommodated cost. Did you say that it was the reflected in, uh, was it out of district tuition and transportation? And so you it's, just took the it's net? It's part of, it is net. So you took the actual cost minus the circuit breaker yeah. from last year and then put the net number in here. Yeah. And those are big numbers, the net. The circuit breaker, we are fortunate that it Where did that go job? up from about 800,000 800, last year. It's, it's up over okay. that. But, but we're still left with the, the big numbers. So it's three and a half million so net out of district that's tuition. Yep. Yep. And then transportation. Transportation is about 1.3 million. Yeah, so yeah. We, you're still looking at four to five million and you're getting an $800,000, only 800,000 toward that. 
Okay. Transportation is not eligible for circuit breaker. Circuit breaker. Okay. Reimbursement. It's just tuition. So, it's just so tuition. what was helpful to me in past years where we, we could see how the circuit breaker support from the state had dropped off, and that I think accounted for a lot of the struggles we had over yep. the, in the special ed cost center and in past years. And it's starting to pick back up again. I think to that point, though, we I'd rather see it as a line item. I would re, too. Re, yeah. uh, okay. uh, re deducted from the from the costs as opposed to the just showing the net number. Right, I agree with that. The, the other thing about Circuit Breaker is that when the law was initially proposed, districts were to receive four times the foundation reimbursement for in-district programs and three times the foundation for out-of-district out district programs. Yeah. So it, there was an incentive built in for districts to formulate and create their own in-house programs. Um, and there was strong advocacy from the private school side not to make that distinction. And in the end, the, the legislature adopted the three times the foundation across the board. Oh. There was no differentiation for mm -hmm. in-district. Had that original law passed, mm -hmm. all the programs that have been created here, you'd be getting reimbursement back for those students. So, um, you know, whatever opportunity you have to share an opinion about that with your legislators might be helpful. <laughs> because I think well, that's yeah. something that people, when they talk about we want to revisit Circuit Breaker and they talk about in let's include budget. transportation, I, I'd mm -hmm. much rather see folks include um, a higher reimbursement rate for your in-district programs. So two quick points on that. You First point is I heard Governor Baker talking about how one of his top agenda items this term is, uh, is, is to recalculate the formula for student mm. uh, or for, for local found, for local. Budget assistance, we'll call it, right? Um, so, point one, it's on the governor's mind, apparently. So that's that's good. Um, point two is the research that you just shared about how students that remain in a regular day environment as much as possible do better. Do better. That sounds like a really good letter you could write mm -hmm. to to lawmakers <laughs> with, hey, there's this research and it would really help us, and let's go back to four to three instead of three to three. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Happy so to do so. That would be great. Written those before. We'll all sign it. Yes. With yes. you. Okay. <laughs> Ghost writer. Um, is there any other questions? That will take some from uh, our guests. Mr. Doxer. Thank you. Mark Doxer. Just um, a question on figure 19. Um, I'm thinking about the out of district placements. It looks like more than half of them are either grades 11, 12, or post-grad. Yeah. And, and also the um, enrollment, I guess, in post is small. Just wondering, is there an opportunity to find programming for the older students that could bring them back in district? It just, it seems like it's such a large number. So I'm looking at the bottom of uh, figure 19. Yeah. Out of district, you've got grade 11 is eight, grade 12 is 17, post-grad is nine, so that's, 34 out of a total of 62 out of district. Mm -hmm. Just wondering if there might be an opportunity there in the future to, to look into a program and, and maybe post isn't, isn't addressing that need right now, obviously with just one student in it. Yep, I would both. have to look at what those individual student needs are for those, those 17 that are in the 12th grade um, as to why, if there's a commonality about what their needs are, which would create that opportunity for a program. So I think that's a, you know, a good point. Sometimes the students, um, so if we looked at say the ninth grade where there are three, are those three kids of a common need where we could create and build a program back here at the high school? I, I'm not sure about that, um, but good, good question. Well, and then, and then the other follow-up question I had to that is, is this something, I, I don't have last year's budget books, but if we look back at the prior years, is there a, usually an increase in the later yes. years, mm -hmm. right? So does that yeah. tell us something about not just the student need, but the student kind of development stage or? Um, yes, yes, yes to all of those. That their, their needs do, do change. Adolescence presents its own set of challenges um, for your typically developing student and um, the kids with special needs, it gets compounded. You also tend to see students who were perhaps more mildly impacted by their disability in the younger age, able to compensate 
due to high intellect for some of their disabling condition. But when we get into middle school and then high school, we're asking them to synthesize things at a higher letter and level and a much more rapid rate so that the um, neurobiological makeup can't always keep up with the demands that we are now asking of these older students. So you start to see the breakdown um, a little bit more in, at the high school level. Um, and there's a fair, fair number of disabilities that are under that emotional umbrella mm -hmm. that don't present themselves in a significant way until adolescence. So you then have that um, nexus um, occur. But you can certainly take a look at any of these numbers at a particular grade and say, geez, do we have a cluster where we could look at a program? Any other questions? Yes. Good evening. Um, thank you very much. Very in informative. I very much appreciate it. You're welcome. Uh, my name is Tom you? Wise. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Elaine. Sorry about that. Um, a couple of questions here. Uh, one thing, uh, most recently, uh, in, in October of last year, the legislature and the governor signed uh, the uh, decoding dys dyslexia law. Yep. Yes. Yep. Um, I haven't seen anything in the budget that accounts for that, no verbiage that accounts for that. Okay. Maybe it doesn't come into next year's budget, um, but maybe the following year budget. Can you comment on that a little bit? I can. So that was signed into law, I believe, October 19th or 20th, and it is going to require that every district provide universal screening for students at a young age to determine if they are at risk for dyslexia. It is intended to be a law that would be implemented through our regular education process because um, and I believe they have targeted kindergarten as yeah. the year. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So we will have to implement some type of screening. Once the law is passed, we then wait for the department to come out with the regulations that guide us in our practice. Um, Chris and I have been already doing research and talking about this. I know a couple of parents had shared information with, um, I think myself, and then also I think with Dr. Doherty last fall. Um, and I did kind of look into some of the resources that were shared with me and, and wasn't really able to get information back, but we are continuing forward in talking about we have to be able to do this. Um, the, I did see on the department's website that they are looking for us to implement this by uh, next school year. So we're kind of waiting on the re regulations, which typically come out with a public comment period. Right. So then we'd have an opportunity, you know, John would get a notice, um, Chris would get a notice, and myself that these are out there, what do you think? Give us feedback. Um, but my, my guess is that they're going to allow some level of flexibility in how we choose to screen for dyslexia. Um, we're not the only state that's doing that. Connecticut's ahead, Alabama has some resources out there. So, you know, I've been researching other states and what they do as well as the International Dyslexia Association. Okay, well so it, it is something for next year. It will be implemented. It will be implemented. Yep. So, they, and they, having they, listened to both budget forums so far, the favorite word is placeholder. Is there a placeholder somewhere in the budget for that right now, or are you not expecting it to be an incremental cost? There will be a cost, how much, I'm not sure, but we do have testing and assessment dollars set aside um, that are used both for our special ed evaluation and we'd have to find some way to use those dollars to fund um, any new implementation program for dyslexia screening. It's screening, it's not testing. Okay, so there's some budget, but there may be, we should maybe think there might be a reallocation at some point in time to adjust if there's an incremental cost that's not forecasted right now. Right. I, I, I would not predict it would be a massive cost increase no. for next year, but um, because my, my experience tells me that the department typically gives school districts some wide discretion around the tool they choose, I, I would be stunned if they dictated a tool. Um, and it may in fact be a tool we already have available. Uh, we just have to use it in a different way. So we're just, we're not too sure how it's going to play out. And we want to do the right thing for the children. So we'd like to have something that we think is not going to over identify children and unnecessarily alarm either educators or parents or under identify. And when you're testing five year olds, the chances are already pretty high. You're, you're, they're not going to be um, as responsive in exactly the same way you'd like them to give you the information. So. Yeah. Um, we want to get it right. We might have to trial a couple of things next year. Yeah, I'm sure the committee is well aware, but 
dyslexia has been one of our biggest challenges in this area for a while with the bridge program and early identification has been one of the biggest problems for that as well. So I would encourage you to continue to think about that and push more forward, be more proactive in that um, from the communication to the committee, I mean, for communication to the public, what you're planning to do there, whether it's MTSS at K through two or whatever it is, it's gonna be the, the way in which you're going to implement that. Um, I would also be asking that you provide feedback on how many students you assess now versus how many students you're going to have to assess. So it's gonna be all of K going forward or all of K and one and two to catch up or whatever it is um, versus how many you've already assessed and you already know where they are. Um, there's definite budget impact, teacher time, para time, whatever it is to do the assessment that's yep. necessary there. Yep. Um, that's one. Um, second question I have is with regards to the, the legal services and settlements. Um, if you look at the munis and you look at the DART discretionary, uh, the word that's written in there, it is specific to settlements. And, you got, and the wording that you have used in your budget is very general and you're allowing other things to go into that than settlements, um, which makes it a little bit hard to compare towns appropriately? Is there potential to move the non-settlement money into a contract line instead of a set into the, instead of the settlement line as it is right now? Are you talking about the legal or the yep. legal, legal dollars associated Currently, with Currently, it says in the budget it's legal services, but when you follow that back to munis and you follow that back to DART, it goes to code 1435, which is specific, very, very specific to settlements. Um, and so it makes it you muddy the waters, for lack of a better way to put it. Okay, I would have to say that's not intentional. I'm certainly not intentionally well, muddying the waters. I don't think you are. I'm just uh, saying it's just a, a point of note. Talking about sort of what the information in the ledger versus the budget and... Uh, they, they align they, perfectly. They align perfectly. Right, but I mean the tools are different, right? This isn't, this isn't the ledger, you know, the munis is the ledger, so... The tools are different, but they're very specific when it comes to reporting to the, the federal, I mean the state government, right? I'm not sure. That's something I'm we can look into. Okay. We haven't. Thank you. Um, one, one more question, I think, um, and actually maybe a point. When you talked about um, the increase of the 49,000 in, in that line in particular, um, and you actually, I think, Elaine, you referred back to two years ago when it was 147,000. Mm -hmm. um, two years ago, we had the OCR settlement that drove that 147,000. We have three outstanding OCRs. Is that part of the budget right now, or do you need to allocate more for that potential OCR that's out there right now? Yep. The, the OCR did um, close the investigation in a November 20th letter, which I believe might have been in an early December school committee package, the, uh, so December there are no more outstanding committee. OCR complaints. Okay. There are a couple of um, services that are yet to be delivered that have been promised to um, two families to finish it, but OCR was satisfied that we've met our obligation. It's great to hear that they're closed. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, anything else on the budget? Uh, oh, a reminder, so um, for school committee members who want to submit questions in writing, actually the deadline is noontime tomorrow. Noontime tomorrow, yes. Um, so, and I don't know if there was anything really that came out of tonight. It just might, work if you feel like it, just clarify with Dr. Doherty, send a little note, or um, there might be a couple things I know that I noted that I wanted to clarify. Um, we have another item on the agenda. agenda. So we are done with the budget. So, and I, I would like to thank all the um, staff and teachers and principals who are here uh, this evening and uh, I think we still have some budget liaisons that hung in here. Did double duty since six o'clock, I think. And um, also our FinCom. So I wanna thank everyone. Um, our next agenda item is the school committee vacancy. So, um, oh, there it is. Um, so I, I need to just sort of like lead the school committee through, through this discussion. So as uh, folks know, actually it was, um, just before our last meeting, um, we received a letter of resignation from Sherry Vandenaker, um, and I think all of us are aware, and she sent a letter to the community, actually the letters in this packet, um, you know, that uh, her, her dad, her father had been very ill and passed and um, hadn't been able to join us as she wanted to, and very, I think it was a very difficult decision for her to make, but she did 
um, resign. So there, um, I've spent a lot of time talking with uh, uh, the town clerk, the town manager, town council, Mrs. Dowd, uh, while Dr. Darty was getting his uh, Dopey Award. <laughs> Is there an award for that? I'm so proud somebody. of that <laughs> because I can barely run three miles. <laughs> um, so uh, and uh, so in the end, the situ and also consulted with our uh, NISC um, field director Dorothy Presser. Okay. So the situation that we're really in is that we're so close to the election on April second that um, by the time we would be able to get through the process with the select board, and by the way, the select board actually leads the process, um, it would mean that a person who would be appointed would be able to attend exactly one school committee meeting on March 21st um, before the election on April 2nd. So uh, the way that the process works, and it's driven by uh, Mass General Law primarily, Chapter 41, Section 11, is that the obligation of the school committee is to notify the select board of the vacancy, and we have to specifically notify them, and then it's um, up to them to um, execute the appointment process. And um, if there is, if they they can actually choose not to execute that process, there are no <coughs> consequences. Um, and as Dorothy Presser explained to me, this has occurred several times, once in her own community. Uh, Dorothy was on her Linfield School Committee for 21 years. Um, and so this did happen um, more than once, actually, while she was there. So, uh, but the select board is the board that would call the appointment process or not call the appointment process. So what I would like to do is, um, if Ms. Sprowski can read yes. the motion and then we can have some more discussion. Allow the school committee vacancy, which occurred on January 7, 2019, to remain empty until the election on April 2, 2019, and authorize the school committee chair to inform the select board of this vacancy and vote. So whatever the outcome of our vote is, I'm going to identify them. I felt like it was important for us to take a vote so that I could clearly communicate um, not just my perspective uh, to the select board. So that's what I would like to do. And I do, I know in our packet it has our policy. I actually do have um, the Mass General Law and the um, statements that came back to us from town council mm -hmm. in the email exchange with Bob, Dale, and myself. So if there, you guys, if there's any questions, I can try to answer them and refer to that information. But basically, um, uh, I will read. Basically, Dorothy Presser said the same thing to me that um, if uh, there that there is no there is actually no specific consequence for the select board if they do not um, put the uh, appointment process in place, and therefore if there is a political policy or a practical <laughs> reason that the the select board doesn't wish to make the appointment, they may simply ref refrain from doing so until the next election. The thing is, they have to actually make that decision, but they would like to know how we feel about it. Yeah. So that's why the motion is as it is. I know our lawyer is looking closely. <laughs> but I have the text in Mass General Law Chapter 41 right here if you want to see it, Nick. <laughs> you put this in the packet next week. I, I should have. So yeah. what was, <clears throat> what's the rationale for not filling it? before the election? Because it's so close mm -hmm. that by the time we could actually get through an appointment process and the board, you know, the notification out to people and then the select board pull all of us together for a meeting, given that we have, uh, fi you know, FinCom meetings, select board meetings, all the budget meetings. By the time we could do that, um, the, our meeting in February is actually February 7th. So I don't, we wouldn't probably get through that process before that meeting. It would be just one meeting, and then the person would be basically off unless they were elected. So there's all, there is, um, the election process is separate from the appointment process. So Laura Jem, the town clerk, all, has already last week um, put notice out, and the papers are available, so there is a two-year slot. Um, so we currently have two three-year uh, terms and one two-year term uh, that will be on April 2nd election. So it's just practically 
Um, and the board, I think, you know, it's, there's, there's uh, whenever a board is, you know, down a, a member or, you know, there, there's an issue, it uh, does put a little bit of a burden on other people. And I think, you know, we've been basically in that since the, definitely the beginning of October, at least. Yeah. And I think we can make it one more month. We, I, I, I do believe that we had pretty much, you know, come to the conclusion, given the situation, that we were going to make it through January. So this is um, basically two more meetings before the April 2nd election. And the person would only make one. Ms. Borowski. So um, I think I hear everything you're saying, and I'm kind of thinking of it as a cost benefit. So what's the cost of filling the vacancy and what's the benefit? And I think I tend to agree with where you're at with it. You know, it's really onerous to do. You have to post the position and you have to allow a certain amount of time for residents to submit a, an application. They have to give a resume and then they have to come to a meeting and it's, you have to interview and you need the logistics of joint board meetings. So it's not a simple or fast process at all. Um, so that's the cost. What's the benefit? And I think you're right. When you look at the calendar, the benefit is a person able to attend one maybe two at the outside, but probably just one school committee member in the capacity before an election where the voters decide who they want to represent them. I think I agree that the, the extensive work to fill the vacancy doesn't seem to match up against what we would benefit from it. And I think your other point is really well well made as well. The, the fact of the matter is we've been functioning as a board of five for several months. It's not optimal, um, but at the moment we're all very plugged in and I think getting the work done. So I, mm -hmm. there's no reason to believe we can't do that for another six weeks. So yeah, I think I would be aligned with your thinking. Mr. Blavin, you. I'm still bothered by the word shall. So um, that's. It's just, just to get everyone caught up where we do are. You, do you see. Sectional. So let, let right. me just read from section 11, chapter 41. So this is what the law of Massachusetts says. It says, in relevant part, within one month of said vacancy to the selectmen who, with the remaining members of or all members of such board shall, after one week's notice, shall, again, fill such vacancy by roll call vote. Notify, did we notify the select board? No, I, we have the 30 days to notify the select but did board. did we notify the no, select board? No, because I wanted to bring this to committee. We have committee. to do that as a committee. Right, uh, well, no, I, I as the chair could notify them yes. or I could instruct the secretary, Dr. Doherty, as the secretary of our uh, committee, to notify. I did not do that yet because I wanted to talk with the board about this yes. issue. We ultimately, ultimately though, Nick, we don't actually decide that, so it is up to the select board. Um, I did want to make sure, and I did check with uh, Ray Town Council, that if we take a vote tonight and we say, and our, our vote is that we feel it's not practical to a point, um, that should the select board then decide to go ahead with the appointment process because it is their decision, this vote doesn't exclude us from participating. The only way that we get excluded from participating in an appointment process if the select board were to decide to go ahead is if we don't notify them within 30 days and um, it was January 7th, so they were well within the 30 days. Because my intention is to notify them after we take this vote and I'll notify them next week. So yes. I, I wanted to make sure that we were protected, that if we make this vote, we can't be excluded. The only way we get excluded from the process, and as I think I think it still doesn't even work because they have to get six votes. So I don't know how they could. There has to be six votes. I don't think they could do, even if they wanted to, I don't <laughs> think they could actually exclude us because they couldn't get the number of votes to appoint any person without having at least one member of the school committee participating. So. Um, anyway, I don't. You would, need a, you would need a quorum of the school committee to participate oh. that night. Right. So you yeah. need at least four of the school committee yeah. to participate. Yeah. I just wanted to make sure that if, and again, I did talk to our field director. This has happened a number of times. It didn't seem, it doesn't seem practical. She also talked about other cases where cert, where members of committee delay their resignation to purposely to to appoint where it forces basically the select board or the committee, the joint committees, not to appoint because of the perception or this people's belief that by appointing someone, you give them a uh, leverage point prior to an election. Mm -hmm. 
this is I yeah. within the time frame that we're in. I don't know that I would say that that's a leverage point, but you could see that if the appointment was made, you know, six or eight months before an election, um, you know, then a person is going to add value to the committee, and potentially that gives them a leg up on other candidates. Um, so I, anyway, D Dorothy was just sort of going through the reasons why at times it's not practical that there's either policy or practical or um, political reason why you wouldn't do that. So yes, that's why I verified that the so, shell. Yeah, two quick, two quick points. So one is, is the school committee shall or will notify. So the only way the school committee can do it is doing exactly what we're doing right now, which is the vote as for yes. a committee of a, a group, right? So mm -hmm. there's not six of us, but there's five of us right now. Well, no. The, the school committee shall notify the board of an of an vacancy. Vacancy, yes. Right. Well, that's we never have taken a vote to notify the board of no. selectmen of a vacancy. No. Cor correct. And, and and I mean, they know about the vacancy. No, that's not the standard, though. Just as we, the, the committee, will notify or shall notify in the statute. So technically, right? we you could argue that we should be take, should have in the past take a vote to notify. No, but this is this is the first time the committee has been assembled since the re resignation. I think this is the soonest we could have acted. Right. It, it it basically is. The letter came in shortly before the meeting last meeting, and I was I personally unable to process I didn't, it. Yeah, so. I didn't. I don't. Know and I don't I think every it. member yeah. even had received it, so it was. Is a little too so, I, I, to me, the, it's pretty clear. The school committee shall notify, and after one week's notice, then the select board is supposed to do something. I, I get Ms. Borowski's point completely. I look at the calendar, too. I'm, are you sure it's is the election the second or the ninth, by the way? It's the second. It's the second. second. Just to update our calendar here, yep. it, was, oh, it says it the says ninth the on ninth, the calendar. Right. But. Yeah. Um, so, but you know, we're going to wrap up budget on the 28th, right? And then, the and then we've got... One meeting in February and March. One meeting in March on the twenty first. Right. We have two meetings. So now I com I completely see the the effort that would be required. I also see it's the select board that acts to call the election or not, not call. not the school committee. Could someone reread the motion for me? Sure. Uh, allow the school committee vacancy, which occurred on January 7, 2019, to remain empty until the election on April 2, 2019, and authorize the school committee chair to inform the select board of this vacancy and vote. Uh, inform them of the vacancy and the vote. I'm having a hard time with the first part of that. Uh, can I? Yeah. I don't know that that's I'm our not, call, but I'm we can say we recommend. I'm not comfortable putting any vote. To, I think all we need to do is what we've always done in the past notify the Board of Selectmen, right. we shouldn't weigh in our value judgment whether or not we should fill the seat. They, they're at, they, they, well, let's just say in, in thinking about this and talking with Dorothy Presser, it felt like we should give them a set our sense, let the Selectmen know our sense, because it will be very difficult to pull together this process to appoint someone for one meeting. And so the idea was we should give the select board a sense. Yes, they control that process. So could we authorize one of our members to attend a select board meeting and express what we've, you know, the views of this committee and just limit our vote to notifying the select board? Um, we we, we there can. There is actually an agenda item Tuesday night. Yes, so it was, it was yeah, that. just to, to discuss so the process. So to, to notify of the vacancy and let them know that this is the general consensus rather than taking the vote? I would just authorize, and we've done this in the past, where we've communicated with our colleagues on the select board where we've authorized a member to attend on behalf of the school committee and to express a view from the committee. Okay. And I, you know, I appreciate and respect yep. all the work background, that, but I, I, you know, I think that... Uh, it can can be kind of flimsy excuse to say we can't get boards together or whatever. We if we need if you need to mobilize for something, uh, you know. I, I I personally don't think that. I think you could do that. I agree. I just think this is practically it's it doesn't add any value to the committee or to the community to have someone come on the board for one meeting. But if if so, if I hear what. Uh, Mr. Bobbin is saying is that just to authorize the school committee chair to I can attend the meeting on Tuesday to inform the select board of the 
vacancy, which occurred on January 7th, 2019. Yes. And, I would support and that. speak to this. Well, you can answer questions okay. that they ask. I don't have a problem with that. But it's their show, right? It's not our show, it's their show. Yep, Ms. Dr. Doctor. I actually, um, I actually disagree with that because I think that ultimately it is our committee. And I think that um, given there would only be one to two meetings where that person would be a part, I think that their energy would be better spent entering the process where the people of our town would choose them. And um, the process, I think, isn't, I think that it's completely appropriate for us to give a recommendation to the select board um, not to dictate what they need to do because it is their decision. But it's not inappropriate at all for us to give them our feelings about what we think is the best approach to filling this vacancy. And I think that the best approach is to let that person enter the race with all the other candidates and have the people choose who should be on our committee, not us, we shouldn't choose. And as much as the law says it, I don't think the select board should choose it. I think they ought to go to the people and the person should be elected. Well, the, and in truth, we would, we're only, you can only choose that to be valid up till April 2nd. Right. But yep. we, I, I appreciate what you, your, your statement, but I don't think our decision should be <coughs> based on political motivations, which is basically what you just said. It should be, our decision should be on the process. What is the process? <coughs> and the process is to tell the Board of Selectmen that we have a vacancy. We shouldn't draw value judgments on whether or not that whoever we appoint is going to provide value or is going to get a, a leg up on the election or any of that. That shouldn't be part of any, any part of our decision, I don't think. Ms. Borowski. So I think, I actually feel like there's more consensus here. It's more about how we get there than, yeah. do you know what I mean? Like I feel like we all, if I'm hearing everybody right. So I think I could get comfortable with what Mr. Vlavin and I think Mr. Robinson are both suggesting, which is we just authorize you to inform the select board that a, board that a vacancy occurred. But I really like this it, and actually appreciate the, it is their job to do, it. so I actually, I'm hearing that argument and I think it's persuasive. It isn't our job to tell them what our preference would be. That being said, I think Dr. Doxer brings up a really good point. It seems very plausible that they will then turn to the chair and say, so what would you like us yeah. to do? And that's, it would be weird for us to say we have absolutely no opinion on that. I imagine it sounds right. like some of us do have opinion on, opinions on that. So I think your solution, we just say there's a vacancy, we inform the select board, but we author, not authorize, you're the chair, yeah. you're already authorized. We accept that the chair will answer any questions should the select board have it about the school committee's preference about mm -hmm. filling the vacancy or not. Is that right. sort of, am that, I articulating okay. where you're That's an excellent yeah. statement of that's what I'm okay. trying to say. I think I can get comfortable with that. I do. So yeah. if we change that motion to just to authorize the chair to inform the select board of the school committee vacancy which occurred on January 7th, 2019. That's exactly how I rewrote it. Yep. Okay. Exactly. And, and yeah, just my, my main concern is, I mean, I hear the cost benefit from Ms. Borowski. I hear uh, Dr. Doxer's uh, concerns about, and others about kind of timing and, um, efficiency and to me that's not where my mind is it's simply with what's written in the law and following and if it says shall I'll do it and if it says will I'll do it it's pretty clear to me so yes yeah, so but my I, I hear all the considerations but for me it's it's not I'm just trying to follow the, the law is very clear I just want to follow it. so, so that motion yes so how Should does this work can I just do friendly a whole amendment motion? And just, um, oh, friendly just amendment friendly, or just friendly, friendly amendment, amendment, to whatever friendly amendment. and yes. for clarity I'll reread it yeah. um, vote to authorize the school committee chair to inform the select board of the school committee vacancy which occurred on January 7th 2019 second, second. Okay. Make second. so vote to adopt that yes so all those in favor the amendment. Of, right the motion as, as just friendly right. amended right Then I will attend the select board meeting and be officially notifying that. Thank you. 
Um, okay, I think we're at the end. Uh, so, I, oh, Ms. Wise. Yeah, sorry, just a point of clarification from, from the earlier statements. The November 2018 letter was about the 2017 settlement. It was not about the OCRs opened in 2017. There are still three pending OCRs against, the, against Reading right now. Okay. We have not received any notification from OCR. Okay, they're on the ed.gov site, so. We've received no notification from OCR. They're there. They may be there, but we've received no notification. From a, my point is from a budget planning perspective, even if you haven't received notification, they're out there. You may want to make sure you have the budget. I'm not opposed to the 130. I think it's the right number overall, considering those things. I just think it should be accounted for and thought of. Thank you. All right. Um, a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Second. All those in favor? All right. Good night.